Hey everybody, tonight we're debating the death penalty and we are starting right now with Jama Bayorn's opening statement, which will be eight minutes. Jama, thanks so much for being with us. The floor is all yours. Thanks so much. Making even a weak argument only in principle for the existence of capital punishment is no easy or straightforward task on either moral or practical grounds. And bluntly, nor should it be when what's directly at stake is the very life of a human being, regardless of context. I hope I'm able to do so in a way that meaningfully improves the dialogue around increasing basic equity, particular raci particularly racial equity in the United States and countries that have a similarly broken uh, punitive system and furthermore increases the sanctions around the use of the death penalty as well as the demandingness which we consider evidence suitable for enacting it on people. I want to begin by sketching out the shape the arguments around capital punishment have taken. The major concerns surrounding its moral permissibility are twofold. First, there is the in-principle concern surrounding under what grounds it should be morally permissible at all. The two common defenses given for its moral permissibility, and as remarked upon by multiple philosophers, such as Finkelstein, Brooks, McDowell, Nathanson, and others, are the retributivist and, and deterrent-based defenses, which I will go on to define shortly. Roughly, one is that one ought to be punished in a lex talionis, perhaps, fashion for their crimes committed. And the other one has to do with the way in which punishment may deter future offenders. However, as Finkelstein shows, and as Sunday will be expanding upon, neither of these two justifications for capital punishment actually hold up. However, capital punishment may still be acceptable and even mandated by the conditions of the social contract in a Hobbesian sense when we're looking at the in principle case. This is the case in which we are no longer considering the actual inaction of capital punishment within morally dubious structures or existing frameworks, but rather whether or not it ought to be made available as a punishment at all for a state that is, has moral right on its side, which may in fact be a condition that is not often met in the first place. My argument, however, to complement Sundays, will be focusing more on the practical aspects of the implementation of capital punishment. I follow Tom Brooks's argument that retributivist positions around punishment, and again, Brooks um, et al. are actually against capital punishment, both in practice and in principle. I follow Tom Brooks's argument that retributivist positions around punishment, even capital punishment, um, falling down strictly in the practical sense because of their inequitable and appalling distribution, especially along racial lines, is still merely, but importantly, a structural claim. Indeed, the argument could even be made that such punishments when they take the form of so-called moral sanctions meted out by a state with no remaining moral authority ought to be prohibited altogether. Even still, this doesn't necessarily commit us to abandon any in principle position about capital punishment, including that it ought to in theory exist. I take this argument a step further to argue that in fact, if we maintain that capital punishment ought to exist, perhaps on contractarian grounds, we're forced to look more carefully at the dire consequences of its existing in a system whereby the basic condition that, X be that if X be deprived of their very life, this must occur at the hands of a legitimate authority is called into question. This may be the benefit to my argument for either side, as odious as it may be to my interlocutors in principle. There's a wonderful quote from Daniel Polsby to this end that Brooks reiterates. It states, being struck by lightning is cruel because it is painful and unusual and because it seldom happens, but is it unconstitutional? I believe that focusing in on the in-principle concerns as opposed to the practical violences and injustice that ought to unite both camps actually takes away from bringing to relief what's at stake in the misapplication of capital punishment. We may in fact only be able to bring these injustices in practice into relief by seriously considering the possibility in principle for it to be retained. Maybe then we'll see that the injustices are endemic to the system rather than the in theory practice of having to end someone's life under extreme circumstances. Before continuing, there's some terminology that's going to be important for both my argument and for Sundays. Two common approaches, the moral permissibility of capital punishments or punishments more generally, centralize the concepts of deterrence and retributivism. Law and philosophy professor Claire Finkelstein describes the first as a justification of punishment only where, quotes, punishing an offender would deter other potential criminals from committing crimes in the future, and, end quote. And the latter as a justification for punishment only where said punishment is justified to the extent that the criminal deserves to be punished. Often it's most simple articulation taking the form of lex talionis or law of retaliation. 
The major concern that Finkelstein has with the first or deterrence approach is that offloading deterrence onto any other human being, which is the usual track deterrence oriented supporters of capital punishment take is morally impermissible. What this means is that if I fail to grant a criminal clemency under the law, for instance, by not granting them bail, what ought to be governing this decision is a moral evaluation of the criminal's actions, not as Finkelstein argues, a simple utilitarian calculation that whether I grant them bail or not may encourage or discourage someone else from offending. If we were to grant them bail at all, we would do so only whereby they themselves would not use that as an opportunity to reoffend. This aligns with the idea that we must act um, on someone in light of their own moral deserts and status, not in light of a third party, thus not using the person on whom we're acting per Finkelstein as a mere means in the Kantian sense. It is for this reason too that I can't torture someone even if it would massively benefit a large group of people. When extended out to capital punishment, the deterrence effect of killing certain criminals in order to deter other moral offenders is therefore not morally defensible under many frameworks. Conversely, maybe the retributivist approach would be more sufficient to make the argument for capital punishment. But even if instead of lex talionis, we merely want to inflict a punishment on an offender that within moral reason in the bounds of law reflects the crime, um, for Finkelstein, justifying any particular act using a proportionality rationale wouldn't make sense. So for instance, we have the moral intuition that lesser retributive acts, such as returning malicious or small petty crimes um, or assaults is not justifiable. Meanwhile, placing someone in non-consensual confinement for life is. Therefore, there has to be something more powerful and morally consistent undergirding any system that allows for capital punishment, such an existence for such as the existence of the social contract itself, for instance. This is a point that we'll be further expanding upon. I want to note in conclusion that even in a morally inadequate and corrupted system, punishments will be needed out. However, these punishments may be disproportionate to the crimes that they are responding to and often cause undue suffering, both for the people that they are meted out upon and for those surrounding those people. Clearly, if we are incredibly demanding around the conditions required for depriving somebody of liberty or even life, we would find capital punishment to be a very rare occurrence indeed. One wonders in these rare occurrence whereby offenders are suddenly capable, um, whereby we're able to determine on the nature of offenders' crimes using things such as DNA evidence, or we know that that person is in the very rare instance beyond um, beyond resuscitation into normal existence, we may in fact be forced into a choice between something which causes lifelong suffering and something which merely quietly and calmly ends that person's life and ensures that everything about their existence was dealt with in a fair and equitable way. These are extremely difficult moral considerations and what punishment ought to occur in what instance in a non-ideal system, which itself is not necessarily in a place to be morally adjudicating at all is a complex set of questions. Uh, that's pretty much summarizes my position. Thank you very much, Jalma. And what we will do is kick it over to the, you could say against side regarding the death penalty in particular, and wanna let you know as well, our guests are linked in the description, folks. And so whether you be listening via YouTube or if you're listening via podcast, wanna let you know we put the links of our guests in the description box of the podcast as well. And we highly encourage you to check out the links of our guests. And so just a quick little explanation of the openings, folks. I wanna let you know that it's going to be eight minutes from each side flipping back and forth. And so now we are going to kick it over to Dylan Burns. Welcome Dylan for the first time here. We're thrilled to have you. And Dylan will have eight minutes as he'll be arguing against the death penalty. Thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy I finally have an opportunity to talk about the death penalty. It's uh, an issue I care deeply about. It's probably one of my most deeply held uh, personal beliefs. So the thing I always found beautiful about the American justice system is how from its foundation, the, the state uh, tried to, uh, in the creation of our state, was primarily focused when it came to our criminal justice system upon the person being accused of crime and making sure they got their, their issues heard, making sure they got a fair trial, and they were able to uh, be able to be seen by their peers 
uh, before being locked away from society. And I found that to be a very beautiful thing because a lot of states really want to have a lot of power over their judicial systems. A lot of times in authoritarian governments like, say, Bashar al-Assad, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and North Korea, the, the control of the judicial system is extremely important because you want to be able to lock away the people you want to. And I found it to be a very beautiful thing to prioritize those being accused. And when you consider the fact that on the low end, 4.1% of people currently on death row are innocent, it makes you ponder. I'm not saying that we should never be able to lock up somebody who is possibly innocent. We, uh, anytime we lock somebody up, you're locking someone who's possibly innocent up, upon further review later down the road. And as we continue to develop new technologies to investigate cases, that will continue to happen since there will be no foolproof method. But if we are to revisit cases and find out after the fact, after our appeals, that these people are actually innocent, that we find out that the people that we've put to death are actually innocent, that means we're using the state to kill innocent individuals not who have not done anything wrong besides possibly being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And as much as being given freedom or, or told after the fact you're not guilty, dumping ashes out the window is not freedom for anybody in reality. And this is just one of many reasons why I oppose the death penalty. The next one would probably be its historical racist applications. So if you were to do any amount of studying the death penalty, you'd find out that it's been disproportionately used against Black people upon any study that's ever reviewed this topic. Not only has it been disproportionately used against Black people, uh, you can look at certain institutions like Pennsylvania, which I believe it's 70 to 80 percent, or in the U.S. military, it's 86 percent of the people in, in the U.S. military that's been sentenced to death or actually uh, African-American. Not only is that the fact, but in fact, if there is a white victim of a crime, it, it is much more likely that you will be sentenced to death than if it's a black victim. Like the rest of our criminal justice system, racism has seeped in deep. And when we give the government the power to sentence people to life or death once we have confined them and they are no longer a threat to society, that racism is, racism is going to seep into convictions. This has also been used historically, uh, even though I, I, uh, I'm probably not going to talk about this, I do want to make note of this, against disabled people, mentally disabled people who have been uh, forced convictions, were forced out of them, and eventually sentenced to death. There's many uh, really tragic cases from the 1950s and onward of this happening, and there's rare instances. It doesn't happen as much today, but it still does happen today where certain disabled uh, individuals around the world, even not as much as the United States, this still happens. Now, I, I'm framing this towards more of an American model because it's hard to look at another, a lot of other countries when it comes to the death penalty because most countries we're in line with when it comes to the death penalty are not countries you really want to be in groups with. We're talking Saudi Arabia, Bashar al-Assad, the Islamic Republic of Iran, China, North Korea, and other governments of an authoritarian nature have been using the death penalty, and they have been using it uh, quite openly towards dissidents of the state and, uh, of course, people who uh, oppose them at certain manners, and, of course, just common uh, of the way criminals. But a lot of the rest of the world has not uh, done this. As time has gone on, they have drifted away from it because they have all realized that in reality, it doesn't seem that the death penalty seems to be a deterrence of crime. In fact, societies that abolish the death penalty statistically continue to have decreasing crime rates within their societies. And when you look at the states in the United States, like mine, Maryland, which has abolished the death penalty, there doesn't seem to be really any statistical difference between those who have abolished the death penalty and those who have not abolished the death penalty. So if it's not having any effect or deterrence, then really the only reason you would have the death penalty in place is this kind of euphoric feeling of revenge, which is certainly not the type of criminal justice system I would like to have, but I think it is the one that has led to 20% of the world's prison population existing in the United States. And speaking of Maryland, which is my home state, um, I have done a lot of studying about Maryland, uh, the death penalty in Maryland before, of course, we abolished it. And even in just our state alone, which is the state I've done the most research in, because it's the one I work in, I, I work in Maryland politics, we used to be paying $37 million per execution in the state of Maryland to actually get this done. So not only is no real deterrence done, not only is it applied in a racist manner, 
And not only do we use the state to kill innocent people, it's also in many occasions much more expensive than just housing the people we would have killed anyway. And the reason why is because we really love in this country giving people in our criminal justice system the ability to appeal, which is good, but those appeals cost money. And people are going to, of course, appeal as much as possible if they are on death row. Anyone would want to avoid death. And I would like to say, uh, in conclusion, well, actually, no, I have two more points. I missed these. So let me get through these quickly. So ultimately, I do think there's going to be a few uh, points brought against me. But one, I wanted to make sure that I got out of the way right off the bat so I don't have to deal with these thought experiments is, well, Dylan, this is all fun and games. But are you telling me that said monster, the Boston bomber, Osama bin Laden, Adolf Hitler, if you would have captured them, would we have not sentenced such individuals to death? I think putting these structures in place that would have sentenced these people to death, which may have deserved it, will ultimately be abused in racist manners. When you talk to people who who um, like house our criminal justice system, and you'll and you'll say, "Well, okay, we allow for Hitler." Well, then someone will inevitably. What about the serial killer? And it's like, well, the serial killer makes sense. Well, what about the brutal murderer and rapist? Well, they make sense too. And eventually, you broaden this list that will eventually end to more innocent people dying. And ultimately, I would also like to say that I think having people who commit horrific crimes have to live with the reality of their decisions, then be given the relief of inky blackness, is actually something I would personally feel as a good sense of justice. When I think of the, the person who raped me when I was a child, I would much rather them have to live with the reality of the impact they had on society with their actions than giving them a quick out with the death penalty. And uh, I have more I could go on to. I can go into specifics of the data. A lot of my data comes from like the University of Maryland, uh, the University of North Carolina, and the uh, ACLU. So if anybody would like to ask for any of my sources on my data, I'd be glad to source them to anybody who came in my community in my Discord. Thank you. Thank you much, very much, Dylan. And want to let you know, folks, no matter what walk of life you were from, no matter where you stand on this issue or all the issues we host, want to let you know we really do hope you feel welcome here. We're glad you're here. And we are, at Modern Day Debate, a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And so with that, we are going to kick it over Two, thanks so much, President Sunday. The floor is all yours for your eight-minute soap opening statement. Thank you, James, and uh, very well said by Dylan. So to begin, today, the death penalty is lawfully administered only by the state, and the modern state holds by a practical consensus the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, which is really to say there exists no greater authority to hold it accountable for whatever violence it chooses to deploy. The state exists, as it were, in the state of nature. And it might seem that while our opponents are burdened with the task of constructing an argument for why the state should restrict itself from enacting a certain kind of violence upon its subjects from the state's vantage, we find ourselves not even obligated to entertain it. It is politics which encompasses morality, not vice versa. The state defines the normal situation and may choose or choose not to choose, as the Weimar Republic did, to deploy any methods, even exceptional ones, in order to sustain it. If anyone finds this dubious, I encourage them to read Book 5 of Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War to see what illustrious company they're in. However, I am betting that what unites both sides in this debate is ultimately not a justification for the state or state action, but a vision for that norm, a vision for the kind of situation that we should want to be normal. And so in a non-trivial sense, I regard this debate as an internal debate concerning whether the death penalty is compatible with a norm, an ethic, perhaps even a sense of justice, that we should both like to see prevail. So to echo Jalma, the state as it exists today may very well be ethically impoverished and lacking legitimacy. So the argument I'm going to present here should not be interpreted at all as an apologia for any existing penal system or government activity. Thus, I won't be defending either of the two most common justifications, deterrence or retribution, commonly deployed for harsh punishments like the death penalty, as well as lengthy imprisonment, mutilation, torture, etc., for the same reasons as our opponents will likely echo that not only are they inadequate as justifications within that ethic, they are easily found upon examination to be odious to it. To quickly reiterate, deterrence fails because it contains no principle to limit to whom or to what extent 
punishments may be administered so long as they are effective in deterring further crime. While retribution fails, despite what I think is the correct intuition that the punishment should match the crime, because it contains no principle to prevent moral absurdities like administering rape to punish rape, or as it were, murder to punish murder. An example which lays spectacularly bare the limits of a retributive approach in that it finds itself only able to excessively punish small crimes while being unable to meet the worst. It is surely not a trivial part of the wrong done to a victim of rape or murder in addition to the corporeal harm that they endure that they were also raped and or murdered. Liberal philosophers like Claire Finkelstein mentioned by Jama already have proposed a corrective in the contractarian justification which, which runs that just as a person consents to reap the benefits of the rules of a community, they also consent to the punishments by which that community enforces those rules. This argument avoids the aforementioned problems and that retribution is not only justified, but consented to by the punished who have tacitly endorsed the lawful repercussions of their actions by enjoying the law's benefits, as well as successfully limiting the deterrent use of punishment only to those who deserve it. I like this argument, but it's not sufficient. And it's, hard, it's not hard to see why. First, tacit consent only applies where we have the freedom and the ability to choose otherwise. And in this world of increasingly closed borders and economic disparity, that's hardly a given. And second, there's still no necessary connection to extremely final forms of punishment like the death penalty or even life imprisonment. Why? Well, because there's no intrinsic reason to think that someone who breaks the social contract can't be reformed into upholding it again later. And it's possible that softer punishments might be as effective or ineffective at deterring crime as execution. This argument needs to be augmented because where it really fails is in the impoverished view of human relationships it implies by restricting the task of justice to enticing and enforcing conformity to a set of community sustaining rules committing in effect the opposite excess of the retributist who prioritizes revenge above all else by limiting justice to the needs of deterrence alone. To illustrate why this is a problem, consider a man in prison guilty of rape and murder who feels no remorse, for whom all attempts to convince him that he should have remorse have failed so that a restorativist, restorativist approach pardon, is in vain, and who furthermore takes pleasure in tormenting his fellow inmates and prison attendees with gleeful and vivid accounts of his crimes, and who additionally claims to laugh every chance he gets at the horror he has wrought upon his victims and their families. Such men exist, and in my country, we are so obsessed with prolonging their lives that we forget that the crime of murder isn't exhausted by the bare fact of loss, and that the dead can still suffer. How? Human beings are rational animals. Just as our rational wills extend beyond our physical bodies in space through things like property, relationships, etc., they extend beyond our bodies in time. We make plans and have hopes for the future. Other animals can be observed to experience pain at the loss of a companion, but we experience equal pain at the loss of and affronts to their spirit. Murder isn't simply the killing of a speaking contract-making body. It's the killing of all a soul aspired to do and be, and perhaps everyone they aspire to make. And even as a dead negative, that can still be wronged. The murderer can laugh, and by so doing, stamps on his victim's will his own. Here, the death penalty may present itself as not simply justifiable, but as a moral duty. Not retribution, but cessation. Not to deter future atrocities, but to terminate atrocities ongoing. Not to avenge the violently wronged or the dead, but to spare the innocent and the living, and not just the innocent living. Because this justification has an additional feature. To keep an incorrigible murderer forever caged out of an obsessive need to preserve his metabolism at all costs is to do him unfathomable violence. He is a human being and author of his actions, the results of which have been desired and chosen by his rational mind. To treat him not as a doer of wrong who could equally have been a doer of right, but as a patient, as a malfunctioning body without a will of its own, which must be, which must be hijacked by a better will, not his own, is to deny his humanity and to affront his own dignity in the same way he affronts that of his victim by laughing and to kill his humanity and his soul for the sake of his flesh. There is as much difference between these as there is between fact and justice, and it, and it is as abhorrent to conflate the former as it is the latter. To such a one we render not only a punishment by killing him, but an honor, this was Hegel's argument, by contrast to hide him away with, with others similarly guilty, away from the world, with no future, no human future at least, to suffer endless attempts to hijack his body with a rationale not his own through therapies and treatments, however well-intentioned, 
is to reduce him to a mule. You've killed him all the same. Or worse, you've condemned him to a living death before his inevitable natural one, which he will meet not as a man, but as a beast. And I don't know if I have, have any time left or if I've gone over, but I yield whatever I've got left. Thank you. You got it. Thank you very much. President Sunday, and we are going to kick it over to the last opening statement. But before we do kick it over to Dr. Ben, want to let you know we are pumped for this Friday, folks, as Destiny will be returning. He'll be debating Brenton, and in particular, it'll be Destiny's moral system on trial. So we are excited for that, folks, and want to remind you, hey, hit that subscribe button and that notification button so you don't miss that one live. It's going to be a blast. And so, Dr. Ben, thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Thanks, James. Uh, so I guess, um, you know, call me old fashioned here, but I don't actually think you need a good reason not to kill people. I think you need a very, very, very good reason to kill people. Um, now, such reasons exist. Uh, if you're in a back alley and someone is coming at you with a knife uh, and crucially, you cannot stop them without killing them, then you have a very, very, very good reason. If Nazis have invaded your country, and you can only beat them back by taking their lives, then again, you know, you, you have such a reason. But what we're being asked to contemplate tonight is the idea of that it's, we sometimes have a very, very good reason. We've, we've somehow cleared that immense threshold of justification uh, for snuffing out the lives of well-secured prisoners. Uh, and I have a hard time imagining anything uh, that, would, uh, that would justify that. Uh, now, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is complicated in a couple of ways, uh, one of which uh, is that I think there's a way that somebody could interpret the topic of the debate tonight uh, on which uh, Jaume and Sunday uh, actually agree with us, uh, which is that if I'm hearing correctly, I think they agree that whether or not the death penalty can exist in principle, uh, it at least should not exist in the contemporary United States. Uh, which which is not a uh, not a small uh, concession if we're all if we're all death penalty abolitionists uh, in uh, in the actual case uh, then that really narrows the uh, the scope of the disagreement uh, and uh, again I'm not certain that that's their position I think that is from what I've heard I think it's worth taking a moment to uh, circle and underline the reasons why uh, it would follow from I think the things that Dylan has said the things I think John and Sunday have agreed to. Uh, that uh, the death penalty should be abolished in the contemporary United States. Because uh, when we hear that there are severe racial imbalances in applying the death penalty, that there are numerous cases of human beings killed by the state who later turn out to be innocent, um, and so on, uh, some death penalty apologists respond by saying that these are reasons to just, you know, say, okay, look, these aren't reasons not to have the death penalty. These are reasons just to reform the criminal justice system as a whole. After all, the same factors can lead to unjust or excessive imprisonment, you know, just like they can lead to the death penalty. So we wouldn't solve the problem by just abolishing the death penalty. And fair enough, we do very badly need to reform the criminal justice system as a whole uh, in some very deep and radical ways. Uh, but all of this is a reason for the United States, at least, not to have the death penalty in the same way that if you have an aged relative named Sam who wants to keep a gun in his home for the sake of self-defense uh, and you're trying to decide whether to let him do that, you know for a fact that Sam is half blind, extremely paranoid, more than a little bit racist and has repeatedly shot at the mailman. Uh, all of that, even if you think some people should be allowed to hold, have guns in their house, for the sake of self-defense, all of those would be really good reasons not to let Sam have a gun in his house. Um, now, I would argue that the issue about unjust conviction is not just a reason that the United States should not have the death penalty. It's a reason that no uh, possible future country, no society should have the death penalty. I'm a socialist, but you're not going to find me claiming that in some future socialist utopia, nobody is ever going to be wrongly convicted. Human institutions are just too fallible for us to be able to be confident that this is ever uh, going to be the case. And someone sentenced to life in prison who's exonerated decades later can at least get part of their life back, whereas without resurrection for the dead, uh, there's simply no equivalent for capital punishment. Another way that this uh, that this debate is uh, has been complicated, given the opening statements, is that uh, the reasons that almost everybody who supports the death penalty supports the death penalty are reasons that uh, the uh, the other side has disowned. Uh, that 
you know, standard defenses of the death penalty involve some combination of uh, retribution and uh, and deterrence. And uh, we've heard that JAMA and Sunday uh, don't actually believe in either of those things. I would argue that if you listen closely, uh, what Sunday said at the end did sound pretty retributive-ish to me, uh, but he at least says that, you know, says that he doesn't. Uh, but since, again, almost anybody who supports the death penalty is going to support them for this reason, uh, it is, uh, it's, worth, uh, it's worth thinking through uh, some of the reasons beyond the Kantian ones that they mentioned uh, that, these, uh, that these don't hold water. Uh, so as Dylan has mentioned, the statistical evidence for deterrence simply isn't there. States with the death penalty do not, in fact, have lower murder rates than states without the death penalty. Countries with the death penalty uh, like Canada, where our, where our opponents live, both live, uh, don't have higher murder rates than countries without the death penalty. It's just barely possible that there are confounding factors masking some real deterrence effects. Uh, but even if that were true, it wouldn't matter. If a combination of different economic circumstances and no death penalty can bring about a lower murder rate than we'd have with the combination of a death penalty with the economic conditions prevailing to death penalty states, then the moral imperative to pursue an economic strategy for lowering crime rather than resorting to a barbaric practice like the death penalty to achieve the same end would be overwhelming. Some death penalty uh, proponents, uh, and again, I'm glad our opponents you know, haven't uh, stooped to this, uh, try to argue that we have good intuitive reasons to guess that the death penalty uh, works as a deterrent, even if that doesn't show up in the statistics. Uh, so there is something that you often find in uh, essays defending the death penalty uh, where, uh, you know, well, they'll make this analogy, well, the death penalty is like a lighthouse. We only know how many shipwrecks there are. We don't know how many ships are uh, saved uh, by lighthouses. But of course, if we ripped down all the lighthouses on the West Coast and kept all the lighthouses on the East Coast, we would have excellent statistical data very quickly on how effective they were uh, or they weren't. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, as far as retributive dessert goes, this is where uh, there, this is where my opponents uh, seem to be the most ambiguous, at least to me. Maybe it'll be cleared up later, uh, because because uh, we still heard, uh, you know, we heard that the punishment should fit the crime, uh, and and so there still seems to be some idea that even if it's not exactly about retaliation that you know, people should be punished in kind, which they've disowned, uh, that there should at least be some sort of proportionality principle. And this is part of why we should have the death penalty for the worst offenses. Now, I know I'm running up to time, so let me just quickly say uh, that, um, that to see why there's no straight road from the worst crime should get the worst punishment to the death penalty should be among the array of available punishments, uh, think, you know, forgive me, this is too silly, but think about the classic film, The Princess Bride. At the end, uh, at the end of the movie, uh, Wesley challenges uh, the prince to a duel, not to the death, but to the pain. He starts out describing what this means. And he says, the first thing you lose will be your feet, then your hands at the wrist, followed by your tongue, and then your left eye. And the prince interrupts and he says, and then my right eye and then my ears, should we gotta get on with it? Wrong, Wesley replies, your ears you keep so that every shriek of every child shall be yours to cherish. Every babe that weeps in fear at your approach, every woman that cries, dear God, what is that thing, will reverberate forever in your perfect ears. So, should the justice system include a to the pain punishment? Uh, well, if you go in on this principle that, um, that the worst crime should get the worst punishment, that the punishment should fit the crime in that sense, you might think so, because after all, not all murders are even created equal. Some are much more savage and depraved than others. And so you might think that the lesser murder should get the death penalty and the worst murder should get this. And of course, what this silly example shows us is that what the principle that the worst crime should get the worst punishment doesn't really tell us a thing about what that worst punishment should be. Just like we'd all presumably agree that uh, the seconds. to the pain punishment should not be on the books. Uh, I think we would argue on our side uh, that the state should not have the power. No human institution should have the power uh, to take the life of a well-secured prisoner. Nothing would justify that. 
All right, we will jump into the open conversation, folks, and want to give you a friendly reminder. All of our guests are linked in the description, so if you want to hear more, you can hear more by clicking on those links. We appreciate our guests. Want to remind you, friendly reminder out there, we want you to attack the arguments rather than the people. So thanks so much for being your friendly selves out there, and we'll jump into open dialogue. The floor is all yours. So, uh, Jalman, in your opening, I, I heard something about a, about the social contract uh, in Sunday's statement. It seemed like he was contemplating a social contract-based argument for the death penalty, but I wasn't quite clear on whether he was dismissing it entirely or just saying that uh, that this doesn't give us the whole reason, you know, for for the death penalty. But uh, would would one of you like to expand on that argument? Well, um, Ben, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to have Sunday kind of expand on his argument. His argument is slightly different than okay. mine and talks about the in principle case versus mine talks about some of the nuances of um, what things would look like in practice and why it may not be tenable currently. Um, I had a few things I wanted to discuss with you in a more kind of fine grained way. So maybe I'll have Sunday open and then I might follow up if that's, if that's all right. Uh, sure. But ju just, just to be clear, like was, was your argument, cause both of you spent a lot of time talking about all the arguments for the death penalty that don't work, which I appreciate. Yeah. Uh, but, but I heard a lot less about which arguments, uh, do work. So I, I kind of got a humanitarian argument from you at the end. Yes. Uh, so, so what I would say in relation to that is that, um, Sunday's in principle case for the fact that there may be instances in which the de death penalty may still obtain these kind of extremely rare and specific instances, um, forces us to think on a practical level using a kind of pragmatist approach almost about the nature of the injustices in the current system. It's not just, oh, we should think about them instead. It's that even, you know, there's a sort of uh, tendency in philosophy, which I think is actually not a terrible one, which is to say, if I were to try to support this almost intolerable thing, and I were to still find some reason why I couldn't just completely dismiss it, Mm -hmm. That, if I put pressure on that point, is going to reveal what's troubling about the system overall. And so on a practical level, what I'm concerned about, um, the proportionality rationale definitely comes in play into play in terms of retribution arguments. Um, I don't think the state is a legitimate moral authority as it stands. And so the idea of it, it engaging in a, retribu a retributive um, act strikes me as absurd, even more so um, an individual having a desire for that kind of act to kind of back up that sort of rhetoric strikes me as doubly absurd. However, the only part of the proportionality rationale that I want to maintain that I think is interesting is that we want to make sure that the response to a crime doesn't lead to mindless suffering and worsening of conditions overall within the existing system. I ideally would not want to see a heavily morally illegitimate state, uh, a compromised state, meet out punishment. And yet, if that state is not meeting out capital punishment, it's meeting out other punishments instead. And we need to be sure that there is something uniquely awful about capital punishment compared to, for instance, putting someone in solitary confinement and causing extraordinary undue suffering to them and the people around them for life, for instance. And we also need to make sure that we know why one is appropriate and why the other one isn't. By forcing us to consider capital punishment and keeping it on the table as a possible response, we're forced to consider what's uniquely awful or, or not awful about it. And my argument is that there are actually things worse than capital punishment on a practical level and revealing what happens when we look at this in terms of um, the souls and the, uh, the, the meaningful nature of people's existences beyond merely you know, bad thing happened, now we need to fix it. You know, this this happened, now we need to deter it from happening else. When we actually look at what's at stake for people, we start to realize there are things far worse than death. And so basically I'm taking Sundays in principle stronger stance and applying it in a weaker sense to a system where really there's no legitimate moral authority to meet out any punishment. But if they're, it's gonna meet out punishment, there's nothing in my mind that makes capital punishment the worst punishment that could be meted out. I think there are worse things currently existing. So that's kind of um, in extreme cases. And again, I would take the instances of meeting out capital punishment down to basically one in maybe every 100 years. And I would only want this to occur if we had empirical evidence, like DNA testing, that that person was actually there and had committed the crime. And we had number of years of very, very careful empirical research into the fact that person could not be brought back or resuscitated into 
uh, a functional stance again. And if we knew they did it, and we knew that it was the rare instance where we couldn't do anything um, to rehabilitate them, then I think there are things worse than death. That's what I'm trying to say. And I'm making a very case for a very rare, rare application of this. So, so do you think that we could just to, just <clears throat> just to add to that quickly? Um, okay. I, and again, like these rare cases are exceedingly rare, and I would agree with and anyone who says that we should absolutely limit the death penalty to an absolute tiny stringent minority of cases. But there are cases um, that do fit the bill. Jeffrey Dahmer is is a paradigmatic one, um, where we do in fact have both conclusive evidence and a confession, um, and a remorseless. Uh, culprit. So it's may I, may I just add one addendum to that? I think Please. it's unacceptable at this point, given that we have DNA testing, to convict anyone in such a way as ensures either brutal isolatory lifetime imprisonment or the death penalty without effective DNA testing to that such that we know they committed the crime being in place first. Like well, I think so, that so has so to you, be in you place. You said that a couple of years a couple times about like we know they committed the crime given DNA yeah. testing. Uh, yeah. but, but but of course uh you know it is uh it's it's not uncommon, you know, like like many of the cases of innocent people uh, who uh, who have been executed, uh, that there is some you know some method of physical evidence sure. uh, about sure. which like crazy amounts of confidence uh, were projected that you had some, mm. you know, sure. you had expert witnesses come and said no 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 given this bit of you yeah. know, given. DNA, given other things, yeah. you know, we could be really sure, and then it comes out, you know, 20 years later that uh, that there was a whole string of people who were, con you know, convicted based on this, and it's actually not very good. So I, I want to say you're totally right about that, but the only addendum to that is that, so then think about this, that person might be imprisoned for life in solitary confinement in horrific conditions. This is a problem about how we judge certainty period across the board, not just in relation to capital punishment, all other sorts of punishments, severe punishments the state could mete out. And so I think that um, that's an important consideration and one that we ought to think about when we realize the state is still severely punishing innocent people in ways that are, in my opinion, worse than death. So I just I wanted mean, to so, add that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, know, I know Dylan wants to get in on this, but I just want to really quickly say uh, I'm not... Um, you know, I think that one reason, uh, you know, why capital punishment would be worse than life in prison, which I don't think should be equated with uh, life in uh, in solitary confinement. I mean, I, I think that we have an actually existing, you know, judicial systems. Uh, you know, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, th I think that there are uh, many countries that uh, that don't uh, that don't do that. You know, so so those there's no reason that the that the the options, you know, should uh, should be limited to death penalty. Or uh, solitary confinement, but also, but as far as just life in prison, taking out the solitary confinement aspect, like one pretty straightforward reason uh, why the lack of certainty would be more troubling for death uh, than for uh, for life imprisonment uh, is uh, is if you have, you know, twenty years into a life term, uh, if the uh, if the conviction is uh, is overturned, uh, then that person can still you know can still get some of their life back, whereas once the death penalty has been applied, it's irreversible. The problem here yeah. is that so much so much is resting on this absolute denial of there being a possibility of certainty. And there are simply cases where we do have certainty. Well, I, 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 but, I, I, but I, I, think, I think that the question isn't so much uh, whether certainty can exist in any case, but what you want the rules of the system to be, because mm -hmm. the threshold can't be DNA evidence for the reasons that we're talking about. That can't be the threshold for certainty if we're coming up with rules rather than just thinking about instances. Uh, if the uh, if the threshold is that some decision maker feels very, very, very sure, we know that that can't be the threshold either. We have too many case, real life cases of convictions being posthumously overturned where that held. If the threshold is a confession for reasons that Dylan you know, mentioned and other reasons, that can't be the threshold either uh, because we have too many real cases of life cases of a uh, of false con uh, confession. So I wouldn't deny that there are instances in which I would feel certain, and I don't think it's irrational to feel certain, uh, but when we're talking about the design of institutions, uh, you know, we we want um, we want there to be to be clear rules and not just judgment calls. But I mean, that is a clear rule. That's a black and white distinction. Do we have certainty or do we not? 
Well, no, but the but the but where I'm saying that you don't have a clear rule is when we have certainty, right? What's the rule for what legally counts as the uh, as yeah. having certainty? The, the 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 thing is, what always will happen is there'll be this new technology in criminal in criminal justice. Be like, well, now we have video evidence, or now we have the, they just told us straight but up. But then that why they punish the anyone for well, anything me, at all? Well, well that's, the thing that's is, already, because that's the thing is, I, I I agree because we need to have some sort of punishment on the whole to protect society because. Nine times because it's a really good chance that when we convict somebody, they were guilty of the crime. Vast majority of the okay, time, that's the case. Well, let me let me finish. This Please, first time I've talked since my intro. Go for it. Um, but having a safe a safety kind of trigger in place that if it turns out on further review after the fact that they were innocent, then we can always pull the lever to let them out of prison. But if they're dead, that's impossible. And when we give the state the power to kill people. We always like we'll say, well, in certain instances, we need to do it when we have irrefutable proof. When somebody's put on death row, that's the state assuming we have irrefutable proof that we're pretty damn confident that this person was guilty. When we get convictions, that's supposed to be the case. But historically and presently, that doesn't seem to be the case. When I said 4.1 percent of people on death row are innocent, that was the lowest possible number. That's at least 4.1 percent of people on death row are innocent. That's not a number any nation should be proud of. And I don't see how keeping it, how we could really like move that number down to an acceptable margin. So Dylan, um, part of the difficulty that I'm having is I basically mostly agree with you. So the debate that we're having right now is should 0.0000000001% of people actually be positioned such that they are up for capital punishment versus should zero? be in that position and what's at stake in terms of suffering and long-term consequences for both parties and reversibility concerns. So the problem that I'm having is there's also a practical intuition that when you deal with things like the United, um, when you deal with things like the criminal justice system of the United States, that their people are not predisposed to want to dispense with capital punishment over other types of punishments. So here's a more of a pragmatist argument, right? Um, given that that's not the case, massively limiting the conditions under which this could ever occur and increasing the demandingness constraints to the point that almost nobody ever in like a hundred years is actually up for this may be the most effective way of actually limiting and radically transforming and moving the system towards a more just um, mode of existing and actually to help restore in fact state legitimacy. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing to Ben, and this is actually like, this is actually like a good faith question. I'm not gonna run around for the rest of my life necessarily never changing my position ever. You know, I wanna actually ask this question, seriously consider this one concern because when it comes to the nature of suffering, yes, obviously it's not just, it, it would be a false dichotomy to say, oh, well, solitary confinement or they'll die. So which one would you choose? I'm not gonna do anything sleazy like that. I don't think that's what's at stake. But in the instance in which a person suffered inordinately in prison and everyone around them suffered and everything about their life was meaningless and they were finally released. And we know for a fact there's not going to be rehabilitation available to most people in a reasonable way. We know the way prison systems operate currently. They break people. I mean, I'm a huge fan of rehabilitation over, over punishment. I think the way that prison systems exist currently is disgusting and repulsive and basically corporate, corporatocratic, right? So in the instance in which that person is released, is the rest of what they could live through until they die necessarily better than if they had simply been given the death penalty in that instance? Like in that one rare once in a hundred years instance where we basically almost knew to the point of having, like to the point that we could say it's a justified true belief across every, um, across every analytic hmm. empiricist um, a posteriori, um, a priori, you know, framework across every possible philosophical system and practical and scientific system that person was guilty. And that one instance in a hundred years, it turned out that they weren't. And then that person was released after a lifetime of suffering, because you know, that person in particular would be the inmate who would probably be in solitary, who'd probably be in those conditions. In oh. that one instance, would that still be better than if they had died peacefully okay. without suffering? So like, that's I, the question. So, so let me, well, was that proposed oh, to me or? You, you guys it was to them, but anybody can answer it. I'm actually just earnestly asking that. because yeah. actually- I wanted to answer the first okay, well, question I'll, first. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. give my answer, but Dylan, if you want to go first. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to answer the practicality argument, the idea that, well, people in the United States, uh, I think it's a little bit, uh, but the statistics are clear that the majority of Americans are okay with the penalty existing. Uh, my state, among other states, though, have abolished the death penalty for many of the reasons I've brought up. There's been a lot of activism around it, I believe. Fair 
Joe Biden has put it on his agenda to end it on the federal level. And I think the narrative is shifting generally on the uh, on the argument, because I think when we look at our criminal justice system and I apply the arguments I've given here today, I think most people uh, will, will reconsider the position, hopefully. But if, if the argument is that in a practicality sake to win over some of the people who don't exactly want to completely get rid of it, but limit it, that we limit it now, I'd be fine with that as a step into the eventual abolition of the death penalty. For practicality sake, I, I can understand somebody making the argument that, well, first we should limit the effects of the death penalty because we can't abolish it at the moment. So let's pass this law, which makes it so we can only apply it to people um, uh, accused of like some of the worst criminal penses physically possible, that it has to like be terrorism or something along those lines. Um, and then eventually use that as a jumping off point to abolish the death penalty. If, if the practicality argument's there, then I, I can agree with you on and using it as a strategic goal to eventually get to the death penalty. Now, when it comes to the, the idea of uh, for, for suffering for all this time in prison and or and death penalty, I, I would make the argument, of course, I, I, I don't put I don't like the idea of putting somebody in prison on the idea of the goal is to make them suffer. And I think we both agree that the goal should be re rehabilitation. The reason why we have 20 percent of the world's prison population of only six percent of the world's population is because we have the most prisoners of any nation in the world, including China, which I think is uh, absolutely um, off the walls is because we don't have an, uh, an extremely rehabilitative system. And so I would hope under my system the, that uh, that I would be proposing, which would not include the death penalty and not include this kind of suffering that we're doing, this type of idea where we throw somebody in a cell, we throw away the key, and then we all make jokes about them getting raped in prison, which is the current culture we have around it. I would like to do away with it. But if your argument is, ab is about just suffering compared to death, I am somebody who is a proponent of death with dignity. And if somebody, uh, this is just generally, this isn't just opposed to prisoners, if somebody was suffering so much that they wanted to end their lives, say, with cancer or something like that, I could I could be kind of maybe uh, debated into a position of, of being like, I feel like they could be able to end their, make, they make the decision to end their own life, which um, if there was an idea like a prisoner was so torn up by being confined that they could, couldn't do it, it was psychologically damaged due to them. I could see a scenario, but again, we're doing we're doing pretty abstract hypotheticals here where a death with dignity might be an option, but they would have to make the decision, not the state. If yeah, I, if so, I may so, interject, so I, I, may I, I interject I, on that I point agree quickly. With that last part, I, I did just want to make sure before too many minutes pass between either between the sure. question that I that I answered, uh, Jalma and. Uh, and so first thing I want to say, just there's no, you know, worry about evasion or anything, just just so it's clear, is uh, would uh, getting the rest of their life back under that circumstance be better? And the answer, I think, is absolutely yes. Uh, so, but, uh, but, I, but I also wanted to go back uh, before expanding on that to something that Jalma said at the beginning of the question, which is that what we're talking about is like a 0.01, you know, uh, per, you know percent uh, application of the death penalty, and this goes back to what I was talking about, you know, with with Sunday a minute ago, uh, which is that I really want to know what these rules are going to be uh, that are going to um, that uh, that are going to guarantee that it's kept down to point uh, zero 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 one percent, right? So you could do uh, you could do the equivalent of uh, of what the you know rabbis in the uh, Babylonian Talmud did and said, like, oh, you can only um, you know, you can only, uh, you know, kill people if there are such and such many witnesses who saw them do it directly and, you know, things like this, where, where basically the goal is to guarantee that nothing that really happens will ever count. But of course, that's just a sort of a cute way of abolishing it, you know, entirely. So, you know, that's a distinction without a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do, uh, you could, you could do things like, uh, like limit it to certain categories of, uh you know, of, of crimes, uh, you know, you could say that we only have the, the death penalty, not for ordinary murders, but for, you know, genocide, something like that. Although I, I certainly don't think that would capture the sort of cases typically uh, that, uh, you know, that would, that would be, you know, that the in principle case that Sunday is, is making, uh, you know, would, uh, would, would apply to. Uh, but I, I'm just, I'm just very skeptical that there are going to be rules that you can use to capture the cases of genuine certainty and uh, exclude all of the cases of uh, of apparent but not real certainty that afflict us uh, in the real world. And again, I do think that the reversibility concerns give us a good reason to say, given uncertainty, 
uh, there is a difference in principle between the death penalty and other and other punishments. But just real quickly to expand on the yes, uh, I think that uh, I think the point that Dylan ended with is exactly the relevant one. So the the question is. Uh, like if you're doing the person, if you're doing the executed person a favor by executing them because their life would be so miserable for these decades in prison or, you know, so miserable that even the, uh, even the remaining, you know, 10 or 20 years or however long they had after they got out, you know, of, of freedom, you know, would, you know, would, it just wouldn't be worth it. Uh, then, uh, then I think that should be up to them. Uh, so uh, so um, you know, as a matter of fact, yeah. most people don't, uh, think that being executed as opposed to being sent to prison, even the kind of hellhole prisons that we actually have in the United States that I take it all four of us agree are uh, utterly unacceptable. But even with those prisons, it's not the case that most people facing the death penalty would view the death penalty as opposed to life in prison as doing them a favor. I, I know there are very occasionally cases where that's true, but in the overwhelming majority of cases, people facing the death penalty will fight with everything they have to get life in prison uh, imprisonment uh, instead. Uh, and people who have gone through decades, you know, of, uh, of of imprisonment and see a chance to to get out. Will fight with everything right. they have uh, to get that. And I'm I'm just not comfortable uh, second guessing them and saying that no 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 you really would have been better off if you were dead. Uh, if that's what we want to do, perhaps we can you know allow people to kill themselves. Uh, but uh, but making that decision on their behalf that it's more humane to kill them, yeah. I think takes us back to the sort of core moral rot, you know, at the heart of the very idea of having the death penalty as a punishment, which is this idea that the that society or the state, you know, owns the person and, you know, and they should have total control over them, even to uh, even to uh, even to end their life, you know, which uh, which which I think is just in principle more power than any institution should ever have over anyone. Yeah, I disagree with that categorically. So to a certain extent, we're talking past each other here. We were very careful at the onset to distinguish between the principal and the practical problem. The practical problem- Yeah, I covered, acknowledge that. You covered, the, very, no, you covered, okay, covered admirably. So, yeah, yeah. But, but no, no, but hang on. So you cover the practical principle, obviously, uh, admirably. There are a lot of problems with how it's done today. There are a lot of uh, inefficiencies and whatnot. Let's say for the sake of argument, we solved all that. You still have the in principle problem of if you have this case, the Jeffrey Dahmer type case, should we keep him alive indefinitely while his existence and his own behavior torments the people around him and the people he's left to suffer as a result of his, of, of his crimes? And I think no, absolutely not. And I, to, if to counter that statement, um, what I've heard so far is that uh, for whatever reason, you're perfectly fine with tormenting a person's soul in prison for 50 plus years, but God forbid anybody touch his body. That strikes me as very strange. Well, that's obviously a silly straw man that has nothing to do with anything anybody has said. Know, that's what you were doing. Um, no, it's 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 not. Furthermore. That's something you made up to <laughs> today. I don't know where you're getting it. Furthermore, I was I was actually quite clear. The reason why I brought up the uh, contractarianism and the reason why we spent so much time dispelling the idea of that um, deterrence and uh, retribut retributivism, pardon, were uh, viable arguments, is specifically to separate them from the argument that we were making, which is not retributivist at all. The point is that when a person is uh, part of a society. They contract not just as a body, but as a human being with human dignity and the right to choose. When we put a person into prison, when we decide that the, <laughs> when we decide that, in fact, in response to his actions, we are actually going to try and change the person interminably, in effect, putting him into a trial until the end of time, until he dies naturally, uh, we are dehumanizing him to a degree unfathomable. In fact, that is the greatest expression of state power I can imagine, far greater than killing him. What any, what the tiniest society finds themselves forced to do under extreme circumstances. Like it just, it just, I, I'm just not seeing how you're actually answering our objections here. Well, so I mean, for, I well, really haven't heard very much about those, those objections. Like, uh, this is part of the thing that makes this confusing, that we got a few minutes at the end where the considerations that you do find powerful for having the death penalty were briefly gestured at. The overwhelming majority of the time was spent disowning standard arguments uh, for the death penalty. But sure. let's, uh, let's, let's talk about... Uh, the uh, the Dahmer case. Uh, so I think first, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, the idea that if we could uh, we could get rid of all the problems about certainty, the death penalty would would just be justified is a uninterestingly vacuous hypothetical because we can't. No human society possibly could. Uh, but as far as the idea, that's a that, hypothetical. That it's 
well, okay, but it's a hypothetical that's uh, that's that's it's not just a counterfactual, it's a counter possible. That's what you are doing when you say that, well, we can't have the death penalty because we may find in some point in the future that every single case has been a false accusation despite a preponderance of evidence and a confession. Not just the confession, what? but also behavior that expresses okay. gleeful pride in the in the crime. Could I just step in really, really quickly Please. on this Sunday? Okay, so um, basically, in terms of me and Sunday, I'm making a weaker. I, I'm I'm supporting a weaker argument, um, like the weaker case, philosophically speaking. So, in other words, like I'm not, I'm not as um, how do I describe it? I'm not talking as much about the in principle. Um, distinctions and investments that go into retaining capital punishment as Sunday is. But what I am doing is I'm saying that I'm taking his discussion of um, Hegel's notion of what constitutes kind of um, the worst sort of suffering you can inflict on somebody who's committed a crime that in many senses may actually violate the social contract and what the consequences that would be. And using that to wonder if there's some arbitrariness around getting rid of capital punishment over another form of punishment. I think Ben, you've discussed um, pretty extensively how, um, you know, in that, that, that there are things that are unique about capital punishment. I may disagree with you on that, but there is one point that you brought up that I thought was really excellent in practice. Um, that I wanted to address in response, which is that, okay, so if we're going to differentiate between the 0.00001% death case and the no none whatsoever on principle, how do we establish the conditions of knowing what's appropriate in that instance? Like, how are we going to actually be able to work on that or think about that or manage that? And the kind of moral intuitions that Sunday is bringing to bear on this are the intuitions that a lot of people have. And so it's one of these things that... Um, it's one of these things that one has to consider the moral consequences when an odious act is committed against for people who are not immediately and directly, who are not the, the person who has immediately committed that act. And also the sort of consequences down the road for other people in terms of how we treat the person who's committed that act. And so I think the practical consideration of how would we ever be able to adjudicate or deal with that or have the kind of evidence that we require is an important one, but I think that we are still nonetheless giving arbitrary status to a person um, being um, executed on the basis of having murdered multiple people or done something that we, we believe we know to have occurred um, over the moral status of other types of suffering, um, of other types of structures that could be put in place, of other things that could be done to that person's um, body or existence or life or those of the people around them. And so I do think there's still a bit of an arbitrariness concern that needs to be addressed. Although I want to say, I take your point that, yeah, we, to be able to determine what we could, that we would know this beyond a shadow of a doubt in a legal sense even is going to be an extreme challenge. And part of that extreme challenge, uh, part of what's entailed in that extreme challenge is how on what a limited basis we would actually be able to actually meet that criteria, right? So I didn't want to acknowledge that, but I also wanted to say that I'm still not fully sold on these the arbitrariness with which we are taking capital punishment to be utterly unique, right? Okay. So, so I don't think it needs to be utterly unique uh, to yeah. uh, the, for there to be reasons to abolish it that don't apply to other punishments. Okay. I think that what I think that one reason to uh, to abolish it that doesn't apply to other punishments uh is uh is the uh, is the the irreversibility you know i mean I, that that seems like a really powerful uh consideration to me and and i and i think the question about how to uh design uh the rules is uh is a really crucial one uh because whether we're you know because there are two things there are two respects in which i think you and sunday are making slightly different arguments, there are two respects in which we're talking about uniqueness, right? One is the sort of uh, uniqueness of, of the degree of certainty that you can supposedly have right. uh, in, uh, in some cases. And the one is the uniqueness of like the heinousness of like the ongoing attitude uh, of the of the person. And, uh, and, and I would just point out that when you're at, when you're designing rules, okay, they can be executed if they've confessed. That stands as a sufficient certainty. That's the sort of rule that you could have in an actually existing system. Uh, but they they can be executed if their attitude exhibits gleefulness. You know, uh, is uh, it, you know seems like a much slipperier thing. You know, in terms of the uh, the degree of clarity that we want for uh, for actual rules. As far as the dehumanization I argument, I would say that first of all. Uh, that uh, if you are, if you've just decided 
that somebody will never morally reform. You know, you've just decided that they'll never change their attitude and they'll never, you know, they'll never feel differently uh, because it's been too long. And so you're just sure that it won't happen. It seems like that is what's reducing them uh, to the status of something that's that does not have free will. If you're treating them as a person, no, no, look, okay, uh, then, okay. then you know that that possibility would yeah. always have to be left open. Also, this idea that this a life imprisonment on. necessarily means an eternal campaign uh, for uh, for rehabilitation, <sighs> you know, it's it's just not true. That they have a that you could uh, that you could say even if for the sake of argument we were giving up on the very possibility of rehabilitation. We were deciding, nope, you okay, don't the, have free will. Problem, you aren't, you ben, aren't a person who with ben, autonomy. Right. Just, to, just to be autonomy, sure, so if you're in maybe like 20 seconds, Ben, if you're able to wrap up this point, and if then you we'll even forward. even if you did decide that you could still say no this is a human being who has certain inalienable rights including the right to life so we can keep people safe from him uh, by key, uh, by keeping him in prison uh, but there are things that we may not do to him okay, Ben you categorically misunderstood the argument the problem is not that we've decided arbitrarily that a person cannot be reformed the problem is that certain a very tiny minority of persons on death row um, are actively engaging in pernicious activity, not just pernicious activity, but undignifying activity to the dead, to the families of their victims, and indeed to themselves. Additionally, this is a very strange and arbitrary distinction you're making with respect to reversibility. Tell me, Ben, if at the end of a person, if a person's life that would have progressed for approximately 10 years later is cut short by the death penalty, or if a person loses 10 years earlier because he has been detained uh, wrongly early on, how is the one more reversible than the other? Explain uh, this. Not, how does one get a decade it's an arbitrary back? Distinction. It's just that you're refusing to uh, acknowledge the actual distinction, which is that uh, once part of the sentence has been carried out, uh, the rest of it can still be negated in one case, uh, whereas in the other, it's binary. Once it's been carried out, it's carried out. That is the case for both. You still lose the time. The distinction well, that's is why identical. I said part. I, you may have missed that word. Part of the sentence has been okay, carried. Okay, so your out. prejudice is just the rest of it can be. You know, the rest of it can still be negated. Whereas in one case, it doesn't come in degrees. Right. You know, you have either been killed or you have not. If I, if I, I may do. just add an addendum to what Sunday just said, is that all right, Sunday? Please. Okay. Um, basically, the so when we were talking about the uniqueness, I think that um, Ben, you were making an important distinction between kind of the uniqueness of different things at play here. Clearly, we're not just talking about you know one thing we're talking about uniqueness so there's something unique um about the degree of certainty that's coming into play there's something unique about um aspects of um you know aspects of the non-rehabilitation component um the other thing too that i wanted to question is is there something uniquely awful about the irreversibility condition compared to any other form of suffering or anything else that could be enacted or the suffering that could be caused not just to the person who committed the crime, but you know, as as Sunday's been arguing in somewhat stronger principle terms than me, the broader community um, break down the social contract, even under horrendous conditions, et cetera. So I kind of wanted to, to maybe um, discuss the kind of the uniqueness of the irreversibility condition a little bit more. Uh, well, one, again, one moment, Ben. Before, before, just a dis it's just a it's just a relevant disanalogy. But I know Dylan has been wanting to talk for some time. Yeah, I okay. wanted to talk about this idea earlier, and it was kind of just kind of scrolled over. I don't know if we all accepted it, but the idea like victims get this like healing through the death penalty. This idea that this that once you pull the switch and you fry the dude or woman, you know, I'm inclusive uh, on murderers, um, then this this healing comes. But I have not seen any data to suggest that, and in fact, the data I have seen suggests the opposite. A lot of times, we're um, in agreement. Right. So like, okay, I just, I just thought you said like earlier, like for the victims, like we- No, 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 not at all. Okay. So just for clarification, if I may, and I'll let you talk afterwards, because I know you have been waiting. Um, my argument is that in the event that you have a situation where the person in prison has no hope of being released, has no hope of being, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, restored, um, and is engaging in ongoing, and as far as we can tell, ceaseless pernicious activity, harming the people around him and harming by the knowledge of the fact that this person is laughing and having gotten one over his victims who can no longer retaliate in any way or gain back their dignity or their lives, that this that the death penalty in this case acts as a measure to cease that harm and purely to cease that harm. As an alternative, mm -hmm. if you see any difference in this, I would be perfectly content if we swapped out the death penalty with a drug-induced dreamless sleep of interminable length, whatever you prefer. So I, I don't think that their ex a continued life uh, can constitutes a harm to the family. But that's just and being insensible to the point I made. Well, 
Will you? Okay, then what? I, I'm sorry, but I, I thought you're saying that sure, they're sure that the death penalty like removes their ability to continue to do harm to the family. Where I think the the internment of the, the individual, family, also the people around them. Well, the thing there is, there are actually quite a few cases of people who have had to be moved around in Canada, in particular, who have been let out and later committed. Last point, and then I want to hear from the, Dylan. Okay, sure, please. So I, I just wanted to be clear, like from the studies I've seen, like particularly from the like University of Michigan, what ends up happening, particularly for the victims, is that many of them end up being like, oh, I, th- I don't know why I thought this would bring my family member back or, oh man, this didn't help at all. And it's like, they're directing their emotions towards this quest to like slay this monster. Then the monster's gone, but all the pain's still there and nothing is solved through that. And so I don't see how them, if they're confined from the family, how that at all could at all be of any damage to the family whatsoever. Well, it's not entirely true that people are entirely confined to the family. People on death row or people in serving long sentences can make constant appeals and the family has to address those. Secondly, we get reports of what happens in these prisons. There was an infamous case locally, um, the name of a person called Cruz Wellwood, who had to be moved around because after raping and murdering a girl at his school, um, he was then bragging about it to people, his fellow inmates, and he had to be isolated from them because he was tormenting them and disturbing them with these stories. Like, this is... I mean, if if those people felt that revenge would get them any sort of sucker, that they were mistaken, and I'm deeply sorry for them, but that's not the argument that we're making here. So, so okay, okay. Could you say the first argument one more time? Oh, you God. said you made two arguments. You said you said one, and then you said the person about the person being moved around. Oh, appeals. Okay. So the thing is, if someone appeals and then gets out, that's how yeah. it's supposed to work. And the idea sure. that we we could have sentenced that person who appealed and got out to death instead. Well, if they appealed and got out, that's good. That's the system. That's how the system's supposed to well, work. You misunderstand me. There's a, in, in, for example, if in Canada you are convicted of a capital crime, um, you can continue to appeal until the day you die. And the problem with that is that this includes people who have been confirmed guilty. Um, we have multiple cases of murder rapists going to prison for that, having been confirmed to have that, serving out their sentences, leaving, and then committing the same crime again. Now, that, of course, is on an individual basis, a deterrent argument. But the point is that um, there is no uh, strong, actual, like, separation between these people and the rest of the community. They aren't isolated interminably. And unless you're going... (laughs) Uh, unless you actually just want them to suffer indefinitely in prison as a contrast, which doesn't strike me as a mercy compared to the death penalty. Well, I, I would say that the, the, the best thing to do would be to, well, if, okay, so the idea is that these people might one day get out of prison and then they might do everything no, 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 again. No, no, no. That's, not, that's not the issue. The point is just that there's not an actually a solid concrete distinction or separation between them and the wider community. We still communicate with them their doings in prison still reach our ears and our eyes. Like this is, they're not just in a separate universe away in a dungeon dimension somewhere. They still exist. So like their existence, because we can still peer in, could end up hurting people because- We don't just peer in. The point is with respect to the appeals and whatnot, um, is that these people can actually project outwards. Like we 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 know of this. Like it's- yes, but the but the, the appeal system, and I would say that any harm that could have been done by the fact that people can appeal, is easily outweighed by the importance of people being able to appeal to the system and actually have their cases reviewed. And one actually data point I didn't bring up earlier is how a lot of, the the reason why I keep seeing at least four point one percent on death row, and that's the lowest number possible, is because when people are killed. Usually there's no reason to actually review their case afterward. Like if they're dead, like, woohoo, you're free. And you pour the ashes out the window. (laughs) Like, what do you do? And so the importance of having the appeals process is another check on making sure that people in our prisons are not not innocent and they're actually guilty of those crimes. Hang on. Sorry, John. Sorry, Dylan. I just wanted to say really quickly, um, I think that what you're saying about appeals and needing to have due process around appeals um, is especially important in a system that is arbitrary in the way that it's going to, how do I put this, like convict people depending on both the race of their victims and their own race. Yep. And in the case of, 3.5% you know, more likely to be convicted I, I've read if it's same, a white victim. Yeah. I, I've read the same cystic and I've been sort of uh, privy to similar and also people can have forced confessions such that they're confessing, but they don't actually know what they're confessing to. 
Um, and in general, they are capable of, people are being capable of being just completely maligned and wrongly positioned and pushed into conditions where they're on death row, which I think is actually a huge psychic harm to innocent people as well. That's just terrible. Um, and that the appeal process is very important within the context of that system. However, I worry that in terms of my argument, at least, which is um, focused on the more practical and kind of volleys back and forth with what Sunday is saying, is that um, that's going to be shifting the goalposts slightly because clearly the demandingness concerns. So one, of the, so one of the concerns that's coming up for everybody that I want to just highlight, because I think it's stuff that we should be carrying forward into future discussions, is the, man, the demandingness concern about conviction. How do we know we have sufficient knowledge? What about the reversibility condition? What allows us to assume a certain stance about the permissibility of certain types of punishments over other punishments? Um, how do we know, how, what's the demandingness around determining what causes maximum suffering? What makes things unique? These are all questions that are going to be useful and fruitful from this debate that can be carried forward. But I think the appeal question is relevant for current circumstances in which exponentially quantum more people are on death row or in these circumstances than Sunday or I would ever want to imagine any other world. Yes. And so that's, a, that's an issue that's endemic and important to these circumstances. And I know I myself thoroughly agree with everything you just said. The point that I'm trying to raise though, and it could, and, and you know, um, What's the, what's the word? It's a, oh, just one second, uh, distinction without difference. The reason why what I'm saying isn't just merely a distinction without difference is I'm still not convinced on this arbitrary, I'm still not convinced that in terms of like different state meted out punishments, that there isn't some arbitrariness around how we consider irreversibility unique, how we consider, um, how we consider um, capital punishment in particular unique, et cetera, et cetera, in a, if we were to be much more stringent and careful about the overall conditions than we were in this world. And so the appeal conditions are the appeal conditions within this world. So again, like I don't, here's a question for you. Do you, this is, and this might seem like a silly thought experiment, but I believe it's actually not because I think it, it gets at what's the stake in capital punishment in particular. Do you believe there could be a fully rehabilitative system akin to the one um, established in like the Northern European model, but way advanced into the future, in which in that rare lightning bolt, very specific, like once in a hundred years instance, capital punishment would still be on the table. Do you think those two things could ever exist simultaneously? So there's a question. Um, could like could they exist or would I want it to exist? What do you mean? Could they? Could is, they? It, is it even I morally mean, I, commensurable? Is it morally, okay, so... I would not want it to because it doesn't match what I would say in my moral system, but I could see it existing. I could see, uh, because again, like all, all my, all, all, everything that I look at suggests that the death penalty just doesn't have a, an effect on like deterrence. So I, I could see someone building this ref, reformative system, but a kind of cudgeling it into it. I could see that happening, but I, I think it's a counterance to the idea of reform. So, yeah, so this is the difficulty that I'm primarily ha having here. We agree on the practicalities almost to a T. The difficulty here is that your moral objections seem to rest, and I'm directing this to both Dylan and Ben, seem to rest on total insensibility to all of the psychological and spiritual harm that results from having people who gleefully take pride in their crimes continue to exist bodily in prison into perpetuity. I mean, it's, it seems to be a moral sense that completely disregards any value in human beings except for their biological continuity, and it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, except that there's absolutely nothing that either of us have said that even hinted at this. It's like the, the sixth time been, that you've I attributed that to us, but, uh, but, but you're pulling that out of thin air. I don't understand where you take yourself to be getting this idea that there's no, you know, that we don't think there's such a thing as, you know, psychological harms, that they have a, that... Uh, you know, if you think that one of the inalienable rights. Dylan earlier was perfectly fine saying that he actually wanted people in prison to live for a long time with the knowledge of their crimes and suffer for it. I, I specifically said. Oh, I agree. I specifically said. There's, there's no. I, whoever, let him, well, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll okay. Let's hear from Dylan. I specifically said that when it came to people like Adolf Hitler uh, and the other example I gave was my rapist. Uh, was that I would much rather them reflect on what they have done within the criminal justice system. Now, if I suggest now, maybe I didn't give enough detail to it, but it wasn't under the idea that I want them forever to just like suffer forever. Now, uh, maybe there might be some primal urge within me that makes me think like Adolf Hitler suffering, I don't care. It's Adolf Hitler, right? 
But I think that the system should be built around the idea of even tr- attempting to reform um, the biggest monsters. But even though in 99% of cases, it'll be uh, pointless because I think building the system around reform and the idea of reform and uh, results in m- much better, much better um, results. So what I'm trying to do with the practical angle that I'm taking is I'm saying that, look, the the moral contention that um, Sunday is bringing up, you know, whether or not you believe he's correctly attributing it to some aspect of what you said or not maintains, which is basically that um, this is a situation in which we would have to disregard most certain moral intuitions people have about what constitutes knowledge, what constitutes justice, what constitutes allowing, um, you know, somebody who is genuinely monstrous across any empirical, across any rare circumstantial situatedness to be like, you know, to, to still um, to still be criminal. And like, in other words, he's saying that there could be instances, no matter how rare and how bizarre they may be and how much evidence we'd have to bring to bear in the demandingness around that, whereby the person was still fully and completely um, remorseless and we could really locate them with the crime. And if those things were to be more or less met, there would be some kind of moral onus that would potentially emerge. And there would be a common notion that that moral onus entailed ensuring that that person no longer existed in society in such a way as they could continue to cause harm or torment or do things or in which they could even be left to suffer in some bizarre way over a prolonged period of time. And so the practical aspect of that concern is what then makes these questions around capital punishment in particular um, and irreversibility unique. And another issue that might come up around irreversibility is that, so there's there's irreversibility concerns in general. Um, And the suffering that's caused as a result of assuming that someone committed a crime um, to the people who are the living leftover family and people who are associated with the victim of that crime continues for a very long period of time, um, even if it turns out that the person who committed the crime was innocent. And so then yet again, I wanna double down and say the real issue here is that we have to be very careful and very demanding in how we actually convict people of crimes in the first place. And a lot of these concerns about irreversibility in the very rare specific case where that would still be a concern would be diminished. And so there's there's just a moral intuition that's common among people that if we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that something is the case, that capital punishment isn't at least worse than other forms of punishment if we were able to actually determine that well, there's, there's the that person had done something, right? So he's he's coming up with a moral intuition that is a common and important one and well um and well founded, right? In some well, well, instances. There's a moral intuition about what the people, you know, like, uh, you know, might be justified to prevent the harm of the person who's bragging about their crimes and thus causing psychological torment to others. Uh, There's, but there's also a epistemic intuition uh, that, you know, that they, that it would be possible uh, to, uh, to eliminate uh, uncertainty and uh, and I think the epistemic intuition doesn't deserve any weight at all because we know that that's just flatly not true. And so even if it's a extremely tiny sliver of an uncertainty, uh, that still does lead to what I'd regard as a really significant and powerful disanalogy between uh, the death penalty and life in prison. Uh, that in the case of uh, of life in prison. Uh, you can have a sentence that's been partially carried out, but have the rest of it not be carried out. And uh, and again, I, I think when it comes to the idea that it might be kinder to people, you know, that like, oh, uh, you know, me and Dylan, you know, only care about people's bodies. We don't care about psychological torment. By the way, of course, we care about psychological torment. What a bizarre thing to attribute to us. Yeah, I'm not making that claim, but yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Sunday made it several times, but they have a, uh, but, uh, but as far as, uh, but as far as that goes, when it comes to you know which is worse, then you know that I think we should ask uh, the uh, the victims of uh, of either. Uh, do we uh, you know like as a matter of fact, uh, pe- you know overwhelmingly uh, most prisoners possibly facing the death penalty overwhelmingly prefer more decades in prison uh, to the death penalty. Overwhelmingly, uh, people in prison you know for decades think that they are having a worthwhile Why is that a life. Concern? You know, when they, when, when they get out for decades, I just see no reason to second guess either one. And I did just want to really quick circle around to say that on this subject of uh, psychological harm, uh, it would be interesting to think about the case 
of uh, of somebody who uh, who hasn't, uh, you know, who who didn't commit the crime. <clears throat> doesn't claim to have committed the crime, uh, but who constantly torments those around him by say, by talking about how awesome and amazing the crime was, how this person, uh, this, the victim totally deserved to be raped and murdered, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and if that person is in, in prison for another defense, another offense, an offense that would not be considered, you know, would not rise to the level of capital punishment, I'd be very curious about whether somebody who was causing just as much psychic harm by never shutting up about how awesome the crime was and how much the victim had it coming and laughing about it, whether that person should also- yeah, but that's, Ben, that's a complete non sequitur. The point isn't that it's just causing psychological harm. The point is that it's also effacing the dignity of the person they tor- they killed. Well, and, it's not a non sequitur. And the families who lost the future- the brought up the hey, ben, I'm still talking. It's, it, it might not so, address the entirety ben. of your argument. Doesn't make it a non sequitur. Okay, and additionally, you you keep bringing up that people in prison would prefer to live out the rest of their lives in prison as opposed to um, being executed for their crimes. Um, <laughs> why does why is that a factor? Like you haven't it's, actually. It's a it's a it's a factor because we are presented with the argument that it's kinder uh, to them. Neither uh, of us have yeah. said that it's actually kinder. I don't believe. I think well, what we've well, said. Well, no, how, slow down. Slow down. Was, I'm not done. I'm not done. That was well. I, well that stopped. was how Jalma ended her opening hey. statement. And also, no, no, no. no Jalma didn't right, say. Well, hold on. Jalma didn't this, say. Just to have order is why don't we do maybe two minutes with uh, President Sunday, and then we'll give two minutes to Ben to respond, and that sure. way we're I just overlapping. Need uh, Jelma didn't say that prison was kinder. Jelma said that we can't just have this simplistic idea that because death is final, therefore it is kinder than, um, therefore prison is kinder. That, that was the argument. She wasn't saying that death is a kindness to prisoners. In some cases, of course, like in with practical, uh, situations where people have been falsely accused and spent upwards of seven to ten years on death row um it is not a kindness because they can still live their lives afterwards as as innocent men but we're not just talking about we're not just talking about human beings as being engines of pleasure wherein the only thing that matters is how much uh fresh air they breathe and how much nice food they have and how many free walks they go on there is the additional factor that we don't actually ask them when we put them into prison. Um, when we keep a murderer who is unapologetic and in fact takes pride in what he has done um, in prison for an interminable length of time in the vain hope that at some point we can force his mind to change that he feels remorse. We are not treating him as a human being with human dignity. We devalue him and frankly, every other human being in addition to that. We treat him as a willless body to be hijacked by the state. That's not a kindness. That's not mercy. That's that's killing the man in soul before he dies in bodily and then spitting on his grave because he wasn't even a human. I want to give uh, Ben the same amount of time, which is about a minute and a half. And then hopefully before we go into the Q&A, if you guys want to keep going, I- I'm open to it, but we usually would be pretty soon going into the Q&A, but I do, hopefully we can hear from Dylan as well as Jalma yet before we do that. So, uh, but go ahead, Ben first. Okay, so there have been many, uh, uh, many suggestions that it would be a kindness uh, to, uh, to pre- get it to prisoners to, uh, to execute them rather than keeping them in prison. Uh, the explanation we just heard of why Jalma wasn't saying that was confusing, that it was, uh, that she's not saying it's a kindness, she's just saying it's not necessarily. Oh, by uh, the way, I go by they, not she, so just throwing oh. that. My yeah. apologies. Sorry, okay. no, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not intentional. Okay. No, no, of course not. I totally, totally not a problem. I think, I think I might've done that first. My apologies. Yeah. Yeah, you did Sunday. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but if they were, uh, they were suggesting that uh, we can't necessarily assume that it would be kinder to, you know, to, to keep them in prison, uh, you know, uh, like rather than assuming that rather than saying that it's kinder, at the very least, the idea that it's kinder uh, to uh, to kill people uh, was uh, was being suggested as a uh, as, as a possibility. In fact, that was really in the opening statement, the only uh, the only positive argument for the death penalty uh, that I heard. And from Sunday, uh, we've had several suggestions that Dylan and I uh, are saying uh, that, uh, you know, don't care about psychological 
uh, you know, about psychological harm, you know, uh, torturing people, uh, you know, by keeping them in prison. We only care about killing their bodies, which again suggests uh, that it would be a kindness uh, to uh, prisoners to uh, to execute them. So that's what was being pushed back against there. As far as the question of human dignity goes, uh, I would say two things. One, uh, that the uh, that the two issues, keeping somebody alive and uh, and holding out hope uh, for repentance uh, can uh, can be uh, be broken apart that they have a that uh, that there would that it would because you uh, think that somebody is a human being with certain uh, certain innate rights that means that you do not have the right to take their life even if uh, they they will never uh, they will never repent also though on the subject of repentance uh, I would say that what deprives someone of their dignity, what treats them as a willless body, is precisely saying that because their current attitude For is beautiful and mocking, there is no chance that they will ever uh, that they will ever be morally rehabilitated. Thanks so much. And then, as mentioned, we'd love to hear from you both as well before we do wrap up. But no obligation if you uh, don't have anything to add before we do go to Q and A, Dylan and Jalma. Um, I think I'm just going to add on my side that in general, I want to keep, I want um, the opposition and everyone to keep in mind that we were working with an in principle and in practice distinction. And of course, as these things actually play out, um, discussing real um, systems and institutions and structures that exist right now, um, that distinction ends up becoming murkier and murkier. And so the claim that something in practice is not only not, you know, morally, um, is not only something that could not be dealt on the basis of any moral authority that could dealing that could deal it um, being illegitimate um, on the basis of its arbitrariness, its discriminatory practices, et cetera, as well as the claim that um, the way in which it's dealt forces us to consider concerns around ensuring appeals exist um, is one set of claims. Relating to that set of claims are the ideas of demandingness. How do we actually know we know? Is empirical evidence sufficient? Is justified true belief about something sufficient? Um, are we able to reverse decisions we make about what we know? These are all concerns that we have immediately in the here and now in a terribly morally corrupt system in which many, many more people are dealt this severe punishment compared to other punishments um, compared to another let's say more ideal system, that's one set of claims. Whether in principle, this type of punishment ought to not be on the table compared to other severe quotes, um, you know, cap, uh, state, state sanction style punishments and whether or not, um, and without even considering the Lex Talionis argument, whether there's something uniquely strange and awful in principle is a whole other set of considerations. One point that I do wanna make that I think is extremely important is that when we consider the possibility that capital punishment may still in principle be a possibility, even if there are no instances in the current system in which we would actually utilize it or should utilize it or could utilize it, we are forced to then consider what's morally at stake for everybody involved in what happens to a person who, for instance, we may know in this more ideal mode, let's say we were able to know is guilty. We also know that we may not be able to know that, and that becomes yet another practical concern. But I think that we still have yet to establish what is unique about capital punishment in principle to an adequate extent, despite the fact that all these practical, such that we would never even consider it, especially given that there might be morally uh, compelling reasons from a certain view, uh, particularly uh, deontological kind of enriched contractarian view about the nature of people's, you know, people's dignity and soul past death and what might actually be at stake for victims and the rest of it, we still haven't really considered in principle what is unique about this punishment in particular. Pretty in practice, I think we agree on a lot. And so that's basically the, the summation final remarks I would make on my side just to kind of summarize my position. So I want to keep that principle practice distinction in mind. Thanks for your patience. And if you'd like to hear more from Jalma or anyone here, I want to let you know, folks, all of our guests are linked in the description. Now's a great opportunity. And we'll give it over to Dylan before we do go into the Q&A. Dylan, the floor is all yours. So I just put a note, and I know nobody's disagreeing with me, but I would like to note this for the uh, people at home, that it seems that nobody here uh, has disagreed with the problems uh, with how the uh, with the death penalty in the United States. Uh, the amount of innocent people that it kills every year with the state-sanctioned uh, killing of these individuals, 
uh, its racist application on how when the victims are white, the sentencing rate is much higher. And when the perpetrators are black, the sentencing rates are much higher. Uh, how there has been no evidence of deterrence uh, throughout uh, throughout other countries. When you have compare countries that have the death penalty or don't have the death penalty, you cannot find data to show that the countries with the death penalty have lower crime rates anywhere. The same thing is applicable to the United States when you compare states. Um, we, we can talk about how this idea of, of a kind of revenge-based system that many people use to justify the death penalty has led to us having the 20% of the world's prison population with only 5 to 6% of the world's population. And uh, it has been a tool of authoritarians around the world. Uh, and when you look at the states that usually value freedom and democracy, they have started to fade more and more away with it as the criminal justice systems have become more uh, accurate and actually and more effective in bringing about reform. So I just wanted to make these points very clear that it seems that nobody here even disagrees on these points. And so for even if we could find a scenario, which we haven't been able to agree upon today, but even if, if we could all find a scenario where we all agree that this penalty in some hypothetical perfect world of applications could be applicable in the United States to uh, stop the disproportionate use against black people, to stop the state sanctioned killing of innocent people, to stop the horrendously high cost that actually is it takes to execute people and to allow people who are innocent to re-enter society hopefully one day and to not have this this wasteful um, uh, monetary this wasteful uh, amount of money being dumped into something that has no deterrence effects whatsoever, we should abolish the death penalty. You got it. Thank you very much. We will jump into this q and I want to say thanks, everybody, for your questions. Nikolai, starting with yours, thanks very much, said, for Dr. Ben, and I think they mean for Dylan, uh, they said, is there an instance in which you would advocate for a life sentence as opposed to correctional programs and rehabilitation? If yes, what is that threshold and who decides? Ben, you can go first if you want. Sure. Uh, so I, I guess, uh, are there instances in which I would say there should be a life? Um, actually, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, can you, uh, can you clarify? So what, like, I want to make sure I have the wording right, that there'd be a life sentence as opposed to. Right. I think they mean, mean a life, life without parole. Do they mean that? Like the idea that they couldn't like what, what exactly? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. That could be. I, I think maybe it's even a life sentence in both cases is um it's just so, that in one you have like the person's going through correctional programs and no that doesn't seem to make sense I think, okay so so I, I think dylan's probably right probably yeah. what the, what the question is getting at is um is should you are there circumstances in which i would advocate that people be sentenced to life without parole as opposed to like 20 to life you know and thank you um and I would say no. Uh, I think that uh, I, I think that when you come up uh, with the cases, uh, if only for pragmatic reasons, by which I mean like uh, when you come up with the cases that intuitively you say, okay, we're not losing anything here by throwing away the key, uh, your your Jeffrey Dahmer's and whatnot, uh, then uh, that you know that sure those people should never ever get out. Uh, well, one, I don't really see the downside uh, to having it be 20 to life as opposed to uh, life without parole, uh, because I'm very unworried about any parole board ever deciding to let out the Jeffrey Dahmer uh, type, you know, the uh, the Manson type. Uh, and uh, and this goes back to a point that, you know, that came up repeatedly throughout the debate. Uh, I think that we should that if we're crafting rules, uh, you know, we don't well, we don't just want those rules to be able to satisfy our, our intuitions in some cases. Uh, we want to think hard about what those rules are going to lead to in practice. Uh, and, and I would much rather err on the grounds of on the side of giving everybody meaningless parole hearing, like everybody parole hearings, even if for the Dahmer types, those parole hearings will be totally meaningless because there's zero chance they'll ever be let out, then err on the side of not letting some people who genuinely might be rehabilitated to have parole hearings. Gotcha. And thank you very much. This question coming in from, oh, wait, Dylan, do you, if you want to add to that, you can. Yeah, I just wanted to make clear that I basically, I want to like emphasize everything Ben said, but also add the point that 
Um, I, I don't see the point of doing it uh, without parole, because if it finds out that we've been able to actually reform somebody to a point where they can reenter society, um, then I, I wouldn't see the 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 harm in, in releasing them when it comes to um, when we talk about the American system, preserving the individual's ability if, if, as long as they are not going to be a harm to others to a allow them to interact with society. Of course, you could talk about the psychological effects it could have on, uh, on the surrounding community, but uh, I, I think a lot of times making that argument could completely upend the entirety of um, allowing anybody who's committed a horrific crime ever from reentering society. Um, so, yeah, there you go. You got it. Thanks very much. And then thanks for your question. This one from Chris Gammon and Nikolai had a similar question in which they asked everybody to answer this. So I'll, I'll read Chris, uh, Chris Gammon's. What do you think about banning the death penalty, but allowing people sentenced to life in prison to opt for the death penalty, or you could say a, a form of assisted suicide, as Nikolai says, if they wanted to? Is that for everybody or? That's right. It seems fine to me. I mean, if, if somebody, I, I, I don't have a, if somebody believes that their 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 confinement and inability to move freely, which it would have to happen when you imprison somebody to try to protect the rest of society from them, uh, and they and they want to choose to end their own life, um, I believe you know they they have the autonomy over themselves to make that decision. As long I, I do think they should have to consult with multiple doctors beforehand to make sure that they are uh, they really are sure about this decision. But I I don't I don't have any personal objection. Um, I'm unsure about the where, where I would stand on this. I think that a punishment that was um, meted out by a state uh, on an individual on the basis of them having violated some aspect of the social contract between the two, if you want to take that frame, for instance, or you want to kind of look at it as something that's been sort of superimposed and then allowing the individual just kind of freely adjudicate what to do with that instead of ensuring that the punishment was delivered in a way completely different than our current system. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know what the moral status of that is or where that should be something that should then be put back onto the individual when it was formerly sort of the role of the state. So I need to, I'm going to remain agnostic about that um, because I need to think about that one further. <laughs> Anybody else? Then after you. Uh, sure. Uh, I am also unsure about how I'd feel about that. Uh, I, I think that the uh, the circumstances uh, in which uh, in which suicide uh, should should be legal are, I mean, like that's that's a that's a that's a very tricky issue. Uh, I mean, I, I I think that you know there are cases that seem pretty clear to me. Uh, you know, like the uh, the end stage patient with an incurable disease, you know, uh, who uh, still has all their faculties about them, but, you know, wants to end the suffering, et cetera. Like those cases are pretty clear to me uh, how far I'd want to extend that. Uh, I, I just have to think about that a lot more, uh, but so as to not be seen as, as evading the question, I will say at least that what I am sure about is that I would be much less bothered by simply allowing people the option of, of killing themselves, perhaps with assistance, uh, than, than I would be by the state asserting ownership over them by killing them. I would just like to note the disturbing uh, way in which all of a sudden, because a prisoner is offered the opportunity to end their life voluntarily, that we therefore completely ignore the fact that they have been imprisoned involuntarily and by the uh, exact for, for all of the same reasons that have been brought up ad nauseum in this debate um we are equally unsure to a cosmic degree that they have in fact committed the crime for which they are in prison gotcha and want to let you know folks something totally weird that i've never seen happen before is happening in the live chat right now there oliver catwell is a, a moderator gone rogue who i cannot i can't i can't like tag them i don't know i'm gonna try it has to be a bug because i know the person behind it but anyway everybody's basically being hidden in the chat right now something's wrong so folks i promise we will unhide you and honestly i think it's a bug because i know the person behind that account he's actually a kind person so there's got to be something funky going on and i will fix it so bear with us folks if you've just been deleted from the chat and we're going to jump into the next question while I work on that. Thanks for your question, Jamie Russell. Let's see. Uh, kind of more of a quick statement in terms of asking, do you have like a short and pithy response from Ben and Dylan until they're saying, 
in the case of brutal killings, we'll give you a chance to maybe just say in those case of the cases of the most brutal killings, what's kind of a, I hate saying to ask you to, to keep it pithy, but the, their question is short. And so we'll give you a chance to respond to that. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? Why is it not okay to do the, the death penalty? And uh, I think if you want to address kind of the objection of like bru- brutal killings. Okay, okay. I, so, I can so- give you an example, actually. There was a, there was an example of a case. Uh, and again, this would be if we're talking, I like an argument of practicality and open will make an argument for, from philosophy so we can tag team it. Uh, one example would be in the 1930s, there was a disabled man that a crime was pinned on. That was a brutal axe murder and rape of a woman. Uh, the man was so, uh, so horribly mentally disabled that on the way when he was bringing away to um, to be executed, he handed his toy train to the guard, the toy train he would usually play with with the other prisoners who really liked the person to the guard and said, hey, can you hold this to me? I'll be right back before he was executed. Uh, a few years later, it was found out that the whole uh, he obviously was not guilty. And so I, I would say the same problem I would have with the murder, the killing, the state ending up killing innocent people and being pinned a lot of times, uh, higher conviction rates on black people and um, disabled people being taken advantage of. But it'll all be uh, concerns with practicality and I'll let Ben take it from a philosophy point of view. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, w- I would say that, uh, you know, even if you have a sort of retributive principle that uh, that says that whatever the worst punishment is, is the one that should be meted out on the people who've committed the most brutal, the most heinous killings. This is where I ended my opening statement. That just leaves open the question of what that punishment should be, which, by the way, also doubles for the social contract arguments, because, you know, if somebody's, uh, if you think that people have implicitly accepted, uh, you know, whatever the legal punishment is, okay, great. But that only comes into operation what we've decided what's what the maximum legal punishment would be. And I think that if you think that people have innate human dignity and there are things that you cannot do to them, uh, you know, it's you can you can do things to prevent them from being a hard you know from being a danger uh, to uh, to society. But there are things that you can't do to them, just like you can't cut their uh, cut their noses off. Uh, I think that you can't kill them. You got it. Thanks very much. And folks, thanks for your patience in the chat. I have demodded Oliver Catwell temporarily until we figure out what's going on. Ryan Wallace, thanks for your question. This one's for you, Dylan. How do you feel about the death penalty for cat girls? What's a cat girl? Uh, you're muted, Dylan. Okay, one moment. So yeah. I, I, I had not, uh, I had not considered this possibility, um, <laughs> and I think there might be one exception. To my death, uh, death, uh, uh, death penalty uh, example, uh, catboy supremacy. Okay, thank you. Continue. Thank you very much, Lil Kim. Thanks for your question. Said, uh, kind of a objection question. Said the Supreme Court ruled that it is unconstitutional to execute the intellectually disabled because it's cruel and unusual. So doesn't that speak to the death penalty being the less humane option? I guess uh, we'll give you a chance, President, uh, as well as Jalma, if you want to respond. Sure. Um, it's a less humane option. Well, I think what it, I think what it speaks to in particular is that it's an option that's appropriate only for people with full agency as a response to a fully agential action. I, I mean, I agree with the ruling 100 percent. Jalma, did you want to go? I think this actually speaks to what you were saying initially. Um, no, I would agree with that. And I would say that, like, basically, then one has to figure out the agency of somebody in that situation um, in terms of imprisoning them, period, and in terms of anything that would occur in relation to them that wouldn't be strictly rehabilitative. So I think that's a broader question. And I think it does relate to the nature of agency. So I would just back that up. If I, if I can comment secondly as well, I think this should be applied across the board for um, people of that description. I, I mean, prison as well is equally cruel in this respect. So I, I don't think. Yeah, we shouldn't be treating that as a binary distinction here. So, oh, it's okay, I'll just go to prison. Anyways. Gotcha. Thanks very much for your question. This one coming in from Will Stewart says, Dylan, let's say a dippy murders five baby hippies and eats their brains live on Twitch. Why should society now become financially responsible for him for the next 50 years? Would it not be a net benefit to execute them? Mm. It ends up actually usually a lot of times costing more to execute an individual than it does to actually house them throughout their life. Uh, there are certain cases where if you get to the like, like, for example, if somebody did it at 18, then possibly if they live to like 102, you might be able to get to the math where it might end up at the end of the day costing more. But for example, for my and this is the experience I have it from 
It costs $37 million to execute one person in the state of Maryland last time we did it. And that's from like the 70s and 80s. So if you account for inflation there, that's, <laughs> that's a decent, that's a chunk of change. So it actually can be quite expensive to execute people as well. So I find the cost saving argument um, uh, not really effective. Gotcha. And thanks, Zirafa, for your deep. Yeah. Can I quickly uh, just respond to that as well? You bet. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with what Dylan said, which is, which is accurate. But I also think at the same time, questions of justice aren't exhausted by cost. And that goes in both directions. If it was, in fact, cheaper to kill them, that wouldn't be an argument in favor of the death penalty either. Sorry, please keep going. Well, also, I think it's also important that in the case, this is the argument against the deference um, claim that people often make in relation to being in favor of capital punishment, which is that, look, you can't be offloading onto a third party considerations that are meant to be strictly between the person meeting out the punishment and the person who is receiving the punishment. And so this is yet another instance of talking about something that should not be relevant in the consideration of what to do in relation to someone who is up for punishment. So I think it's actually really an unethical way of approaching it, not on the part of the commentator, but in overall structural sense. You got it. Thanks very much for your question. Zirafa, deep. They say, thanks for the debate, everybody. And question for all, you're about to be executed for a crime you didn't commit. Your last thoughts in words, what are they? <laughs> so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. All right, now I like Sunday. I like yeah, it. That pussy that hit different. Um, yeah, I don't think I like that pussy hit different, but, uh, I think something along the lines of, well, this shit is fucked. Good thing I wrote my memoir. And that'll be the end of it. Thank you don't very much. Don't let this happen to anyone else. What was it? Don't let this happen to anyone else. Hmm. Thank you very much for your question. Lewis Barnett said, what system best brings justice to the victims? I think reformative systems are probably the best because ultimately they produce the least amount of victims. Uh, when you when you have a system that's based upon um, we our current system is like high rates of reincarceration. We do not invest the time and effort into prisoners as we want. The private uh, prison um, uh, industry is extremely barbaric and not getting the prisoners not only assistance and like trying to actually re-enter them properly into society when they leave so they don't fall into the same functions, but even like uh, giving them basic nutritional health. There's a lot of instances of private prison uh, companies cutting when it comes to like food and they'll end up actually serving legitimately just moldy food to prisoners. And so if I think if we actually want somebody to re-enter society as a productive member, we need to start treating them like they just like they have the respect of a member of society. And so I think reformative systems are the best ways to give victims justice, because as, as somebody who has, you know, I guess this is personal, but as somebody who's been a victim of, of, of quite violent, uh, uh, violent and horrific crimes, um, the best way for me to have justice is to know that it's happening to the least amount of people as physically possible, and, and nobody has to go through that stuff again. I just want to back up that last claim that Dylan made in strong terms and say that I think that's entirely, um, you know, courageous and morally appropriate as a statement. Um, and I myself am a huge fan of rehabilitative style systems for a similar reason. I think that we have a moral duty and responsibility to pour our resources into rehabilitating people wherever and whenever we can. And that this is going to be the main thing that improves um, the structure and nature of society as well as, of course, um, eliminating systemic injustice. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of rehabilitation. And I think that it actually creates the social conditions such that um, victims are able to live in a better world. You got it. Uh, I, I would just, I would, I would just really quickly add to that. I mean, I, I agree with everything that, uh, that both Dylan and Jalma said, but, uh, but I, I would, I would add that, you know, Jalma brought this up earlier, you know, whether it would be possible to have a system like that and still rarely apply, you know, still have the death penalty on the books, you know, but, you know, and sometimes applied, but very rarely. And I think it, you know, it might be possible, but I think realistically, it's deeply unlikely. I think that the kind of changes in societal attitudes towards crime that would get us the kind of system that Dilma and Jalma are advocating are ones that it's it's very hard to imagine that that happening without them being accompanied by the abolition of the death penalty. I do want to also add that earlier, like I talked about, there are there are numbers to back this up. 
that um, when it comes to getting people justice and this feeling of like, you know, we can start to heal, frying the guy or frying the woman, frying whoever they were, um, rarely helps, if at all. And a lot of times there's this moment of like, I wanted it to bring them back and it didn't bring them back. It can actually be a moment of kind of reflective sadness. So I, I don't. I, I think if, even if you wanted to get this idea, well, it'll it'll emotionally help them heal. A lot of times it doesn't. Thank you very much. We'll jump to this next question from Farron. Oh, Salas. hang on, I haven't answered yet. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, well, I'm going to echo that I am also very much in favor of a restorative system uh, with gentlemen Dylan and Ben. Um. It's also important to note that justice is not exhausted. Um, by harm reduction or by um, psychological healing. There are other things in play. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say on that. I'm exhausted. Go on. You got it. And thanks for your question. Farhan Salah says, thanks, James, Ben, Dylan, President Sunday, and Jalma for your time and preparation this evening. Crushed it. I couldn't agree more. This Honestly, people really enjoyed this in the chat. And so thanks so much to our speakers. And another one from Will Stewart says, Ben and Dylan if it is immoral or unjust for the state to execute is also therefore is it also therefore moral and unjust for one to protect their life through lethal force in self defense no no i i, I mean i i think again the 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 disanalogy this is how i started my opening statement uh is between uh you know, killing in uh, in in self defense when your only options are to uh, are to kill or be killed, and uh, and killing a uh, a well secured prisoner uh, who you could keep everybody safe from without killing them. I'm uh, I'm a known supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, my household is a firearm household. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the difference would be in those scenarios that we're talking about. Uh, I can't exactly properly confine the person into a rigid, no, they're, if they're trying to kill me, then I don't have many options. Whereas when somebody's confined and no longer a threat, we have the option of, of, of confinement. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from, by the way, uh, let's see, Lord Bryant says, hello, President Sunday. And then big thang, Bruce Wayne, thank you for your question, says, should the death penalty include economic criminals? White collar criminals do more damage to society than violent individuals. For me, it's still the same. No, I don't death penalty, but I think it would. This would be something for Sunday and the other. What do you think, Sunday and Jalma? Well, it's directed to you, Sunday. So go first. That's actually, that's actually a difficult question. I don't, uh, but my, I intuitively know. I'm just trying to think through. Sorry, can I have the, could you read I, it? I, I, again, like, I, I, that one's tricky. I think it would almost be, like, I would have to confess that that's, that's a major overstep if the state were to make that kind of decision. Um, sorry, Jamal, what were you saying? I just wanted to hear the question again really quickly. You bet. They sure. said, should the death penalty include economic criminals? White collar criminals do more damage to society than violent individuals oftentimes. Well, I think crucially, we weren't making a, a retributive argument. So that's that's not really a factor here. We weren't making a deterrent one either. Um, the point was in the event where you have a person whose uh, continued existence was, or sorry, for whom prolonging their continued existence was also to prolong um, a pernicious activity that was causing harm and dishonor to their victims and their victims' families. That would be that would be an appropriate situation. But you could the bare fact that someone's caused damage. So, I mean, just to also answer that really quickly, um, because I'm kind of in the same general side. Um, sorry, is that okay, Ben? I'm just going to jump in quickly. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, all right. Um, so basically, what I would say is that I don't think talking about distal overall large scale mass scale harms, wherein yeah. We're talking about the actual downstream or tertiary or secondary effect of a specific action should have a punishment that is directed typically towards a specific um, firsthand thing. So like, if it's like, so what I'm saying is like, in that basis, like we're really stretching the limits of things and we're not, and we want to be able to keep this as morally 
um, and on moral and legal grounds as specific to the person and the actions and the party that the person committed the actions knowingly and you know with malice and forethought presumably or whatever else we want to say we want to keep it as narrow as possible because there's there's a point at which then um we start and again like i don't know why that in the rare instance in which capital punishment would be the salute the the uh the way of dealing with the situation why in that instance in particular you would be going after a, a white collar criminal whose actions had led to many deaths because that's also letting die versus murdering if that white collar criminal had gone in directly murdered a bunch of people in a specific way and it managed to get extraordinary reach in that process or people had been used by him as his arm or something, then maybe there's another, there's another reanalysis that could occur. But again, like the distinction between murdering and letting die is one, the one about the direct consequences and effects of individual actions on a person and the moral status associated with that is another. Um, I just think it'd be a very strange way to, uh, a strange place to start with capital punishment in the very, very extremely rare once in a hundred years instance where that would actually happen. So I, I think that'd be strange. And if I can just jump back in really quickly, just, just for clarification, mm -hmm. the argument wasn't that a person did something really, really bad and therefore should be killed for it. The argument was, if this is the only thing that is left to us in order to uh, terminate um, an ongoing act, an ongoing pernicious activity, that, that would be, that would be a case. So, I mean, I, it just doesn't seem like an analogous case. So, so, but that, that's, that's, that's the part I don't understand because it seems like uh, given the sort of scenario that you have in mind, it would be no problem at all uh, to concoct a version of that for, uh, for white collar crimes. I mean, like, and, and we can look, I mean, we can think of like many real instances, you know, we can think about the Enron executives laughing around, laughing over the phone about the, uh, the rolling blackouts they were engineering in, uh, in California. We can think of the, uh, of uh, the managers at Tyson Chicken, uh, who uh, in you know like office jobs, who had uh, who actually had a betting pool about how many of their workers would uh, would contract COVID, uh, and so it's it's it shouldn't be any stretch of the imagination to imagine somebody who's been imprisoned uh, for uh, for an economic crime that led to massive amounts of suffering, uh, constantly tormenting uh, those around them uh, by uh, you know by by bragging about uh, about all the suffering they'd caused by by mocking you know their victims by yeah. talking about how hilarious they found it that you know somebody whose pension they took away you know wasn't able to pay for yeah. their kids insulin you know I, I don't really see the disanalogy well okay that's an important point i think the disanalogy rests in the nature of the thing about which they are bragging i think there is something qualitatively distinct about rape and murder in particular that is not carried over to the kinds of admittedly heinous things that you're referring to. I'm actually a little bit ambiguous on this now. Um, I, I mean, like, I, truth be told, I think at this stage you have to think about it more. I think I'm largely just uncomfortable with the idea of killing people for those specific kinds of crimes because it seems to require a different kind of activity on the part of the perpetrator than rape and murder do. One, exactly. And that's one of the things I would say too. Um, there, there could be a distinction again also between like being really vicious and hideous and evil and letting people die and have being in a position of power to and being able to enact things and capital punishment being one in a rare instance of set of conditions whereby somebody had committed individually specific acts that were in the realm of murdering specific people in a specific context instead of letting them die and then all the demandiness conditions everything we else talked about everything else we talked about actually obtained in that case that seems like a unique and specific sort of thing that being said i'm not 100 percent on this either and i also want to make it clear that um, the distinction isn't between retribution on the one hand and one where we couldn't really figure out how to engage in retribution like we're not we're not supporting retribution at all necessarily and saying that there might be something unique about murder that ought to be considered in a bunch of different lights. It doesn't have to be a retribution light that we consider it in. And we also need to have another think about what constitutes murder, what constitutes uh, downstream effects, what constitutes deliberateness and actions. This is a bunch of philosophical problems, and, um, like trolley problem level, right? And if I can just, just jump in quickly, as if to illustrate, really, I have really absolutely no problem. Really super short response. Yeah. Then I, gotta go I, I, have, I have no problem saying whatsoever that such a person equally deserves to die. So it's not a matter of retribution. 
Next up, thanks very much. Brenton Langle is in the house. Good to see you, Brenton. Oh, that's right. So I got to remind you guys, we are very excited as you guys, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be epic on the bottom right of your screen. There he is. Brenton will be taking on Destiny and that will be a lot of fun. And so we hope you make it Friday. Brenton says, everyone be sure to check out Ben's Give Them an Argument and namely podcast and YouTube channel both. Right, Ben? Mm Mm-hmm. And then also Dylan's Hippy Dippy Roundtable. And I got to tell you guys, I mean, I want to encourage you to go to all the links of all the speakers that we have on tonight, especially like I, this has been a joy. You guys have all all been really civil and it's been fun and enthusiastic. And I also want to mention Dylan Burns. I love, (laughs) is it fair to say you have a, it's a debate channel and I have to say, I love your showmanship. It's a fun, it's just, it's very fun. So uh, yes. Our guests are Thank linked in the much. description. Oh, absolutely. And so I want to encourage you folks to check out our guests that are linked in the description. Oh, it's just one click away. And Spider the Ateo, thanks for your question. Oh, wait. One Invisible Ninja first said, here is a little something to help grow the channel. Gave extra. So glad Ben is back. Thanks so much for your support. And uh, yes, we uh, we do appreciate Ben and, and all the other speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, and Spider the Ateo, thanks for your question, said, was it okay to execute Gordon Prescott in 1926? I don't know who that is, but if I... he was a well-secured prisoner, no, it was not okay to execute him. Yep. Uh, thanks to Ben and Dylan for uh, jumping off the diving board first. I also don't know who that is or what was going on, so I can't really speak to that. Um... <laughs> Identical, yeah. I'm not sure of the of the context. Yeah, that's uh, same here. I'm in the same boat. And let me see if there was any one. Let's see. That is it for our, our questions. We do want to want to give a huge thank you to our guests. We really do appreciate them. It's been a total blast. And thanks, everybody out there, for your support. Super encouraged to just hang out with everybody tonight, both, I should say, all of our speakers as well as everybody in the chat. Thanks for hanging out with us. And so I will be back in just a moment with a post credit scene about upcoming debates. So stick around, folks. And one last thank you, though, to Ben, Dylan, President Sunday, and Jalma. It's been a true pleasure to have you. Props to, uh, Wonderful. props to Sunday for the Douglas Adams reference. <laughs> you all have a blessed one. Thank you so much, James. It was really lovely being on. Yeah, thank you, James and Ben and Burgess. It was actually a pleasure. I got a bit heated, but I, I respect what you guys do, and it was it was fun. Yeah, Happy I had night. a great time, too. Yeah. Take thank care. you. And we'll be back in just a moment, folks. Thanks so much. that was a fun one i honestly am so pumped that honestly one that was the first time we got to do that topic and it was really interesting and i just loved it it was a fun and enthusiastic i love it you know it's like that there's a balance between there's you know civil and there's passionate and you know like aristotle's doctrine of the mean you know it's kind of like you're not too uh there's such a thing as going overboard and going off the rails and there's also such a thing as frankly just seeming like you don't care that's so when i think tonight was that perfect balance and so uh, people were passionate and uh and yet civil and so we i just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to our guests who are linked in the description what are you waiting for you know if you want to hear more you can hear more from all of them and also though yeah we want to say i have so many like huge thanks to give to you Thank you guys so much for all of your support. 
I am really excited about where the channel is going thanks to you. One, I want to give a huge thank you to Topot. Two, thank you so much, Topot, who big, also, a.k.a. Topot Cell in the Twitch stream, uh, because right now we're streaming on Twitch as well. want to let you know, Topot helped us big time as, you guys, we basically, uh, we had no, none of the emotes, none of the like cool stuff uh, that Topot's helped us with. There you are, Topot2. Good to see you. And so Topot2 helped us. So we have emotes. Now we have these cool looking panels. And I'm just like, thank you so much, Topot2, for real. And so our Twitch looks souped up, which is really cool. And we hope you enjoy and want to let you know our Twitch, I am linking in the description, or I'm sorry, I'm linking it in the live chat. It's in the description too. But I am putting that in the live chat in case you want to see that. And or in case you'd like to click on it and see our Twitch and also see like the beautiful artwork, thanks to Top Hot 2 that you can see there at our Twitch now as it looks great. And so I'm excited about that. I am also excited that we are one Twitch subscription, I think. We're one Twitch subscription to unlocking another emote. And so that's cool. And so I want to let you know, folks, if you have if you have Amazon Prime, you actually get a free Twitch subscription from Amazon Prime that you can use on any streamer that you want on Twitch. And so I want to let you guys know about that. And I even want to let you, I'm going to put the link for how to use your Amazon Prime membership for a free Twitch subscri subscription that you can use for anybody. I'm putting that in the chat right now in both Twitch and on YouTube. And you probably already knew it if you're on Twitch. You probably knew about that little secret. But nonetheless, in case you did not know about that, you guys, it's pretty cool is that it's basically it helps us at the channel. And one of the things, for example, is if we had 100 people who did this Amazon Prime free Twitch subscription for Modern Day Debate, that's $250 a month, which is like when we start doing in-person debates, we could use that for a, at least a one-way flight, maybe a round-trip flight. So like we want to do a lot of in-person debates this summer again. And so that's one way you can support the channel if you have Amazon Prime and won't even be an extra dime. Sigma Any, thanks so much for your super chat set. Thanks, James, mods, and guests, and groovy chat humans. Still fuming from the outrageous timeout, JK. I know. I, I got to let you know, I have no idea what that was because the person behind the Oliver Catwell account is one of the most kind, reasonable people I know. And so I was like, at first, I was like, oh, he's kind of, you know, like, he's kind of going, he's hard on people. And then after he like <laughs> deleted like <laughs> everybody, I was like, that can't be him. Uh -uh, I don't believe it. And so Lewis Barnett, thanks for hanging out with us, said, I really enjoyed this one. I'm so glad to hear that, Lewis. Me too. I loved it. Vegan Jerry, good to see you again. Brooke Chavis, glad to see you as always. And thanks for connecting me with Tapat for those that Twitch artwork, which looks great. And also, Den Kono, good to see you again. I am excited, you guys, as basically we, I noticed during the stream, if you are not subscribed, I want to remind you to hit that subscribe button and that notification bell. That way you can see this debate live this Friday night. Destiny's morality will be on trial in particular, so that should be a really fun time. And so I encourage you folks, it's going to be really fun. And so I want to encourage you. And also, I'm excited though, you guys. We are two, I think two subscribers away last time I we were at. I think we made it to the next uh, landmark. We're at right now, I'm not joking, we're at 43,999 subscribers. So if you want to be the 44,000th subscriber, uh, we're, it's like at that, the odometer. Isn't it the odometer in the car when it, it's like it's turning over and you're, it's at like 9999 and you're like, oh, you're watching it? That's, I'm like, so do want to encourage you. Yeah, you don't want to miss this debate this Friday. And I'm excited though. I'm encouraged that we're on the cusp of 44,000 subscribers, which is insane because I'm like, wow, when we, when I started this, it was just like, it was like, hey, this is like fun because school can sometimes be exhausting and this is just a way to have fun. And then all, yeah, just strangely, it was like, it was a fun hobby. Just kind of got a kick out of it. And I'm so glad though that other people have enjoyed it and that you guys, you guys make it so much fun. The more, the merrier. Data Panda. Dado Panda. Sorry, I'm late in answering your question in the chat. They said, ha has this channel done a debate on gun control? We have. 
and it's going to be on the podcast where it's a uh, it was an old one, but it was a good debate. It was between Doctor Tim Sai and Tom Jump. That was a good debate. That's going to be on the podcast this Thursday. So, folks, if you if you happen to have a favorite podcast app, oh baby, pull out your phone, open up that favorite podcast app, and find Modern Day Debate because we. Not only do we have probably every other day we have our, we put a new debate up because that's probably how many debates we have per week is maybe like three or four each week. We also on Thursday do our throwback Thursday debate where we actually upload a debate that you could say it was a debate that occurred before we even started our podcast. And I want to let you know, yeah, basically it's really cool though because some of those are like We've got, you know, people in the past that have been awesome debaters. And it was like, hey, this is a great way. Throwback Thursday. We could like have a, you know, a way in which we could like conveniently put that up. And so hopefully that's useful to you. And yeah, I'm pumped though, you guys. So Caleb says James's last meal of choice would be a soy protein bar washed down by a soy protein shake. That is so true. <laughs> I was, yeah, so much soy. Louis, but yeah, let's see. Catch it up with the chat. Fox Sushi, good to see you, friend. King 101 says message retracted. But yeah, so glad. I think everybody's back now. For some reason, whatever happened, I don't know what it was, but Oliver Catwell played the ultimate prank on us. That was weird. I'm like, what happened? But uh, let's see. Nikolai says, James would thank the warden for the polite and well-facilitated execution. Yes, <laughs> that's funny. But yes, our favorite, our, our podcast is on all these favorite apps. So, you know, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, What's the green one? Spotify. <laughs> Thanks. And Podcast Addict. I mean, you name it, Google Podcasts. And so I'm so excited, though, that that, like I said, people have been downloading it, which is encouraging because I was like, when I first started it, I was like, is anybody, I don't know if anybody, you, you know, is this useful to anybody? And so I'm so encouraged by that. And so, but yeah, I am pumped, you guys. And let me tell you, um, I just love hanging out with you guys. The more, the merrier. You guys make this fun. And so, I appreciate you being here, and let's see. Catching up with the chat. This is, uh, but yeah, I, I do appreciate you guys. Big thing, Bruce Wayne said, idea, it's more moral to be, let's see, agnostic. They, they claim, he says, hey, I, they say, I'm claiming that it's more moral to be agnostic than fundamentalist, and they say, take team debate, I want it, with two theists from, from different religions. All that might work. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm like not against it, but I mean, I'm like, I'm a little behind on setting up debates. There's like, honestly, I, I really feel bad because when we get emails and then uh, sometimes emails sit for weeks and I'm just, I just can't, I just don't have the time to try to, I try to respond to everybody, but it's really hard. Big thing. Bruce Wayne said debate idea. We are currently in hell. That's an interesting one. In some ways that seems real. And big thing. Bruce Wayne says, follow up debate. We are in heaven. Or the best of all worlds right now. Maybe. But, yeah, Tusk Beatbox, good to see you. Thanks for all of your support. And, yeah, you guys, I just appreciate your guys' support. You have no idea how much it means, the positivity and the encouragement. I'm like, thanks so much. It's fun. We have a, a unique style here. And it's like, I'm so excited, though, that people have enjoyed it to where it's like, that's super encouraging. And so uh, we do appreciate that. And then let's see. Sideshow Nav said, you are forcing me into the tech world, hurting my old brain. Good to see you, Sideshow Nav. And uh, Dencono said, a debate on ecology topics such as invasive species would be inter interesting or specific pollution. Uh, maybe. I, it's new for me. I'm, it's like uh, Bali Nax says, what would your last meal be? Ah, man, I don't know. Maybe lobster. I love lobster. Lobster, shrimp, steak, and ice cream probably. That's pretty good. But uh, I'm so – it's like for some reason I'm like really sensitive tonight. Like to even think of like knowing it would be your last meal would be heartbreaking. But uh, Car Carlitha Rochelle says, can you update more on podcast? Yes, we are. We are behind. So like we're usually – it's like when a debate is live on YouTube, it's usually like two weeks later that it comes out on podcast. It might eventually catch up. It's just that um, – We've got a lot, like we have so many debates that it's like, but yeah, so I'm, I'm pumped though. And I hope that's useful to you. And then Tuss, thanks for your hearts. And Clinton Rosh says, some of us really need you creepy clown music. I appreciate that. 
to say the least. Toss Beatbox says, the Spotify library modern day debate is so smooth to have. I love it. Thanks. I'm so glad that it's, that's encouraging. Yeah, here they are. These apps, you guys, if you're just cleaning around the house and you just want to, you know, have something on in the background, not bad. If you are on a long trip, like a road trip, or maybe it's just a commute, 20 minutes a day, whatever that might be. And you're like, hey, yeah, and like, not bad. Pretty useful because it's long form content. So you don't have to like reach down and like click, you know, to the next one. You can just play it and it'll last for at least two hours. And so, or maybe some of them are like hour and a half, but that's pretty rare. Let's see. Um, Manic Pan is good to see you again. But yeah, a huge thing is, uh, thanks for your kind words. Christiana McFarland said, I think you're a great moderator. Thanks so much. We purposely, we really do. Uh, I do this, and I also, the other moderators generally probably have a, a similar style. We don't want to control the debate too much. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, the reason is there's such a thing as being over controlled or overly formal, or you could say overly produced, where it's not spontaneous. If the moderator, if it's too controlled, gosh. It can be boring sometimes. And don't get me wrong. I like debates where it's like nobody cuts anybody off because sometimes we have debaters who are just like very easy, you know, easy going and they're not, they don't cut each other off. And those are good. Don't get me wrong. But I like it to be organic like that. And so sometimes it's a little fiery and, you know, I know that I only occasionally like, all right, hold on. Let's not let it go too far. I call it controlled chaos. And I think that it's good and I have no apologies for it. And I just appreciate your guys' encouragement and yeah, so I, I do appreciate. Uh, and the other thing, too, is it's not just that it's arguably more fun to listen to. But I would say the other thing is it's more fun for the debaters. The debaters don't go on a channel wanting to have it be, like, all formal and controlled. Now, they don't want it to be a mess. And I agree, like, once in a while we go we let it go too far. I admit that. But nonetheless, uh the debaters don't want the moderator jumping into the debate too much. Believe me, I know from experience. A lot of these people who some of them like maybe are critics and it's like, well, uh, believe me, I've debated on channels where the moderator is jumping into the debate and debating one of the people. And it's like, uh, not what we're looking for. Brooke Chavez, thanks for your support. Says, thank you, James, for all your hard work and dedication to this channel. Thanks so much, Brooke. Seriously, that really does mean a lot. It means seriously more than you know. So... Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. And then Jamie had a question about how should we consider, uh, death penalties in light of the Bible and how that's an interesting question. I, I truly don't, I've never even heard the question or thought of the question. So it's interesting, but uh, by the way, if you, if you emailed me, Jamie, I got your email today about the, uh, asking if I was okay. I'm, I don't live in, um, you probably already got the email. I, I live about 45 minutes north of Boulder. So um, the King Super is where it happened. Uh, that's the name of the grocery stores that we have here. Um, one of them. Uh, it it wasn't my King Super, as you could say. So um, I my heart goes out to the families um, who like experienced that tragic loss. Um, but yeah, thanks for reaching out and just asking if I was okay. I really do appreciate that. Yeah, because yeah, it's like, a, you know, um, Boulder I'll visit once in a while, but it's rare. Um Carlitha Rochelle says, James, you are hot and you're doing an awesome job here. <laughs> Thank you. I <laughs> appreciate that. You're making me blush. I always think Carlitha or, you know, people like sometimes it's like it'll be like Tiffany and it'll be like, ooh, hi, James. And then, you know, you find out Tiffany is actually Earl, the postman from Alabama. And he's, you know, telling me that I'm hot. But I believe you, Car Carlitha that you're not Earl the Postman, my old stalker. Uh, but yeah, so I <laughs> appreciate it. Sideshow Nav says, Controlled Chaos rocks. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. Manic Panda says, Hey, James, night was great. Big fan of Dylan. I have to be honest. I'm a big fan of Dylan too. And I, the reason I, I, I like couldn't say it too strongly during the debate because I don't want to like sound like I'm playing favorites, but I love Dylan's channel for a multitude of reasons. One is that it's, it's a debate channel and I love that. And so, you know, he's, he's got all sorts of people on the channel. And so I, I got to tell you folks, if you, sorry, Twitch chat, I'm behind in case you've been saying hello. It says, Hey, if you, uh, thanks Brooke Sparrow for your support in there in the Twitch chat, I'm peeking in there. And so basically 
Um, he's got all sorts of guests. And also, I just love the Hippy Dippy Championship, for example. The like the belt, and, and it's just a, it's a fun example of showmanship. I Dylan, I just love it. I, I appreciate because there's a lot of YouTubers that I just feel like they don't have a. A lot of times they're like a debate channel has to be all serious and boring. And so like some people don't get that, namely, for example, the hippy dippy championship that Dylan has, or they have like a legit belt. It looks great. And, uh, you know, so it's like, I think Vosh is the first one to win it. And so long story short though, is that, uh, for me, I think that is fantastic. It's amazing. It's fun. And so I just love that Dylan has that showmanship and, you know, he's, he's not boring. He's fun. And so anyway, I, I pre, I'm so glad you enjoyed him being here and we hope to have him back. And Phil, the logician says, hi, James. Hi, Phil. Glad. Thanks for being with us. And Bali Knox says, do you sometimes find it hard to stay out of the discussion? Um, it's, it's not too hard in the sense that I, I like try really hard to disconnect myself and to be like, Hey James, like I, I, you know, I remind myself, you have to be like completely impartial. At least that's what I try to do. Um, I would say it's like rare once in a while, if there's something that I hear that's like blatantly flagrantly false, I'm like, and I count on the other debater to say it though, because I'm just like, um, so like I'll at least give them a chance to say it. And depending on what it is, um, it's like, usually it's not something that like would be, you know, like I'm trying to think of. So yeah, it's, that's when it's hard. Uh, and that's, and I'm like really picky too. Cause there's a lot of stuff where it's like, well, that's kind of subjective, but there's some, there's some stuff where it's like, uh, if I know, for example, the meta analyses that have been done on certain things in psychology. And I'm like, no, I know what the most recent like research says. Like, I know that you know, like sometimes I'll see someone I'm like, yeah, that's just not true, but that's where it's hard. Clinton Roche says, James has honey, honey's in the chat. Earl the Postman, indeed. And so that's funny, Tuss. Uh, appreciate your kind words. And then Frank the Truck Driver, that's right. I Yeah, he's another one of my favorite people. Um, let's see. Clinton Rosh. Uh, whew. But yeah, you guys get me excited. Carlitha says, no! Um, appreciate your support, Carlitha. Seriously, glad you're here. The master says, vegan debate soon, James. You're right. We actually have one tomorrow. No joke. I haven't made the thumbnail yet because I'm so behind. But yeah, we will. It's going to be Brian and Anna are going to be back. I'm really excited about that. Jamie Russell says, I'm a Prime member on Amazon. And seeing that with that service, there are free Modern Day Debate podcasts available. Check it out. Like and subscribe. Thanks so much. I'm confused, but I'm encouraged. I, but yeah, but yeah. So thank you. And yeah, where is it? I I just saw it from Tuss. Um, we want to put that up. Where is that? Um, Tuss Beatbox says the first hippy dippy championship is linked here. That was between Bastiat and Vosh. Absolutely. And so that is linked at the top of the chat. I encourage you guys to check that out. Yeah. I just love that. I'm like, finally, somebody who gets like, who enjoys kind of that showmanship and kind of like, you know, like extra flair. I just loved it. Um, and so I, I appreciated, I, I, I'm happy that Dylan Burns TV does his channel and, uh, his Twitch and his YouTube. And, and so Jamie Russell, let's see. But yeah, Darth Revan, good to see you again. Um, Den Kono, good to see you. And then Reservoir of Gore says, Reservoir of Gore, poker face that occasionally pokes. I don't even know what that means. This is some sort of dirty joke. But yeah, Dan Kono, you're right. Those those annoying vegans strike again. That's the name of their YouTube channel. And they are so, honestly, they're, they're just really congenial. I love them. And so I'm glad that they are coming back. Tuss says, James and Dylan will probably be very close friends within a year calling it. Yeah, I, I got to be honest. I really like Dylan. I just, he's very authentic. I get why people enjoy Dylan. And so I, I do appreciate that about him. And I'd love to get to know him more. He's a cool guy. And Den Kono says, uh, let's see, talking smack. To, <laughs> but yeah, you guys, I just enjoy hanging out with you. And so thank you. Let's see. But yeah, I'm, I'm just like peeking around. And I am excited though. 
You guys are huge supporters, and I just hope you know how much I appreciate it. And we are. Right now, we just hit 44,000 subscribers. So thank you guys so much for that support. Thank you so much for just hanging out here. It makes it fun. And so, yeah, I, I just... Um, I always thought, you know, I when I started a debate channel, I loved it because I thought I want a channel where I can simultaneously produce content and learn simultaneously. Like, because I was like, oh, it'd be fun to do a channel where I get to learn while I do it. And so, because you know, listening to these debates, guys, like, as you know, I'm, I'm guessing you've learned things too. It's like you can learn all sorts of stuff from all sorts of different people, and that's just awesome. And so, yeah, but yeah, I'm pumped. And so, um, I would say that one big thing that is helpful is. If you want to support the channel in a way that it's just like easy and, you know, like, you know, save your money, like, don't worry about that. If you just share the content, that helps. So, you know, for example, if it's like on Facebook and you share it, uh, you know, post it or whatever, or if you are on Twitter and you retweet us, I got it. Yeah, you guys were on Twitter. Let me show you this. I'm going to put the link in the description because I'm pumped that we're on Twitter and... I want that to be accessible to you in case you want updates on when our new de our uh, our Twitter when our new debates are coming out because I always uh, tweet in the morning. Clinton Rosh is right. He says stay hydrated and get some sleep. I agree and I will. I promise. I'm gonna log off in just a minute. Thanks, Tuss Beatbox says remember to hit the like button. Thank you, Tuss, and I agree. Please do support the stream that way. Big thing, Bruce Wayne says, debate idea, college athletes should get salaries. Oh, that is actually, that's a pretty interesting idea. Um, I, I saw that in the news about a year ago, I feel like it was. Maybe not even a year ago. I think over the summer it came up. Um, and so, yeah, I, General Balzac says, gun control debate coming up. I'll watch it and call out the anti-gun folks. Um, not on the YouTube channel, but on here, General Balzac our podcast this Thursday, I've already selected the throwback Thursday debate that we're going to upload onto the podcast and it's going to be our gun control debate. So, Hey, check that out on your favorite podcast app and that'll be a convenient way to find it and listen to it. That was between Tom jump and Dr. Tim Sai, who we hope is doing well. And, but yeah, our Twitter, I've just pinned it at the top of the chat. So I want to encourage you like, Hey, yeah, check it out. If you're on Twitter, uh, we would love to hear from you. Like, feel free to always tweet and say, Hey, what up? And cause Twitter needs some positivity. Argon, the sad said still 43,009. Yeah. I, I think it might be that it takes a while to up update because I'm in the cre the creator studio, unless somebody just unsubscribed, <laughs> might be, I don't know. But um, yeah, so in the creator studio, it says 44,000, but I think it takes a little bit extra time on the, the normal watch page for it to, uh, I think, so I think you're right. It, that's why it says that. And uh, let's see, Sideshow Naf says, sharing is caring. We do appreciate your sharing. And Reservoir of Gore says, wasn't being filthy. I meant you maintain a poker face during the debate. And only, re only really challenge the debaters. Poke does sound dirty, though. It does. Duncono says, <laughs> I want to see some hard-hitting debates. Wine versus beer, rugby versus American football. That would be interesting, and it would be new, too. Big thing, Bruce Wayne says, debate idea, aliens control the world. That'd be interesting. We're trying to get that fellow who um, somebody is going to try to reach out to him. They're trying to get him where he's, uh, they emailed and said that they were going to try to get him, I, I think. The fellow you see in the memes where he's like this, And he's like, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. We're trying to reach out to that fellow from the History Channel. That would be pretty cool. And thanks for your kind words, Sigma. And he says, fantastic as always, James. Many love to any humans, lizard, ghosts, and the other beings reading this. Thanks for that, friend. Do appreciate your positivity. And yeah, but I'm excited. And so you guys, seriously, you guys make my day. It's really fun. Bali Nax says, any religion debates coming up? <sighs> yes. Maddox returns this Saturday. And so uh, he's going to be debating one-on-one -on -one with Randolph. I think that's this Saturday. What have we got? Oh, I didn't even tell you guys about upcoming, upcoming debates. Sorry about that. So tomorrow is veganism. Thursday, Jim Majors and CJ Cox are going to debate whether or not Moses existed. So you don't want to miss that. That'll be a fun one. I love that it's a new topic. So that should be fun. 
And then, uh, let's see, we might have, so do you remember um, Maddie? We might have her come back to debate whether or not the flood happened. The, uh, the flood of Noah, whether or not that happened would be the title. And so that could be a really fun one. And so that is up in the air. It depends on Maddie's availability. And so not for sure yet, but thanks for your feedback in the chat as well from General Balls Access. Computer issues still want to get into a gun control debate against, but must, but most of the folks here are against gun control. Ye yes, uh, they say, but most folks here are against gun control. Oh man, I like people in the chat, I would think a lot of people in chat, I, I could be wrong. I don't want to speak from... But I think a lot of people actually would probably be for more gun control. But Balling Axe says a debate on feminism and women's rights could be good. We tried that. Surprisingly, those gender issues don't do as well with the audience as I predict. Oh, that's right. So Friday, of course, that's a morality debate with Destiny and uh, Brenton. That'll be fun. We haven't seen Destiny in a while. I hope he's doing well. Good old Steven. He's a nice young man. And then uh, I think Dustin and I are the same age, maybe. Uh, but T-Jump. Uh, oh, T-Jump and Mouthy will, de will be debating the super straight topic next week. And so, yeah, I'm pumped, though, you guys. We're trying to set up one with Maddox and Mouthy Infidel on socialism versus capitalism. And then we might have a tag team debate, not this weekend, but the following weekend. <laughs> it's going to trigger a lot of people. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we might have a tag team debate. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, thank you guys so much for all of your support. Fernando Farisi, thanks for being with us, my friend. Let me know if I pronounced it right. I hope I did. But yeah, we, we do appreciate you hanging out here. Now I'm going to try something. Let me see if, um, if Dylan is still streaming. Can you remind me, how do I raid someone's, um, raid Dylan Burns TV? Let me try to do this. I'm going to try to raid Dylan. Dylan um, oh, maybe he just stopped streaming recently. I don't know. But it says, doesn't it show he's live? I'm trying to invade his stream, but I can't remember how to do it. Does anybody, can anyone help me remember, like, what are the, what I have to put into the, uh, Let's see, raid Dylan Burns TV slash raid. Um, let's see. So those of you, yeah, so Dylan's live right now. I can't remember. Oh, okay, so slash raid is, so, okay, let me try this. Um, Thanks for your patience with me, with me. Boomer stuff. I'm working on it. Oh, that didn't work either. I can't remember how to raid a stream. How to raid stream Twitch. I'll look it up. I'm on Google. How to use raids. To start a raid, type slash raid followed by... Do you just put like... Oh, maybe this will do it. Let me try this. Thanks, Top Subtle. Top Subtle. So is it Twitch TV and then slash? Then I put the slash? I think it's working. No! Come on. Uh, we did this once before. So what's the full? I, I Sorry, top, top Subtle. I'm a boomer. Bear with me. Is it, so do I put this where I would put, uh, oh, you type it in chat? Oh, that is so cool. Thank you for showing me that. Oh, I love it. Oh, it's so cool. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> it's that hard. It's not actually hard. I am just... Uh, okay, we're ready to raid. Here we go. I'm excited. So yeah, 
Thanks for telling me that. I'm so excited. And yeah, I'm going to wind down and want to say thank you, though, everybody, for just hanging out. Um, Caleb says, you're supposed to tell us all to go there. I, I, um, I rated it on Twitch. So if you're on our Twitch, I just jumped over there. And then so Reswad, of course, said a debate on torture would be interesting. Have you already done a debate on pornography? I haven't done a debate on either of those. Let's see. But yeah, I want to say thank you guys seriously for all of your love and support. And so I'm going to pop into the, oh, cool. Okay. Oh, cool. I love it. So this is cool. Wait, are you guys, do I understand right that um, when we, when we, when we go into another stream, we're able to like share the picture of like modern day debate um like those the our uh, emotes that's cool i didn't know that it works can we do emote we can do our emotes in dylan burns tv his his stream now is that because we is it only because we rated him i don't know but it's cool i like it so that's awesome and i gotta get nightbot i've been told that so i am working on that that's in my list of things to do for the channel and so but yeah thank you and let's see Bali next says james you look tall i'm only i'm about like i'm a little tall but not super tall i'm like six foot and a half inch technically so uh let's see clinton rosh says steal clean rest well thanks for your kind words my friend thanks for your support and yeah you guys thank you guys i love you guys seriously it's always fun i'm excited we'll be back to one according to the creator studio so thank you guys so much for your support thanks for sharing content all that stuff it seriously means a lot and i'm excited about the future you guys i honestly am determined believe me let me wrap up with this beyond a shadow of a doubt believe me you guys i am 100 percent determined Monterey debate is going to continue growing it's going to grow big and we are excited about the future and so tonight is an example of it we just crossed into 44,000, and so thanks for your support you guys it's all you. Thank you guys so much for making this channel what it is, for making it awesome, making it fun. Thanks for all of your support. And I got to, yeah, believe me, we are going to strive after our goal, our absolute vision for the future of providing a level playing field, an equal nonpartisan platform where anybody can come and make their case on that level playing field. And so thank you guys for supporting that. Thanks for supporting the vision. Thanks for everything, you guys. I love you. I hope you have a great night. And thanks everything. I, I love you guys. Thanks for all your support and love. And you guys always make it fun. And so I am stoked, you guys. You just It's always hard to leave. I just, I seriously appreciate you. So thank you guys. And appreciate it. Reservoir of course, and congrats on the 44,000 subscribers. We're excited about it. Thanks, everybody, for making this fun and awesome. And Clinton Rosh says, 500,000 subs coming. You guys, I'm dead serious. Like, we, I seriously believe, absolutely, we will get to that point someday. It's going to be a while. Might, frankly, take 10 years. Like, who knows? But it's, it's. I'm absolutely determined. Yeah, someday we will get to 500,000 subs, for example. That's the goal. That's what we're shooting for. And thanks, everybody, for all your support and love. I love you guys. Thanks for everything. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable, everybody.